Russia. Hey everyone, welcome to the C plus plus one oh one week four. This is April thirtieth, two thousand and twelve. This is a Monday, and we are going to be talking today about functions. So I'm here, my name is Nelson, and also Gavin is here. Hey. Hey. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, start up Visual Studio, and we're going to be talking about what functions are, uh, how to use them, where they're appropriate to be used, and let's have lots of fun with it. So, uh, is uh, functions not just the same as methods, then, in C Sharp? No. Well, it's... See, I was hoping you'd say yes, and then that would be a very short lesson. <laughs> It's complicated, and we're going to go over the complicatedness here, well, in this class. So, what is a function? A function is, in C++, a function is a uh, bit of code that can be executed. Um, and as a result, like, for example, main is a function. We've been saying main is a function the entire class, although we haven't really sat down and talked about how to make additional functions in our program. So the characteristics of a function are that they are a block of named code. So as you see right here, our int main function is a block of code, and it is named main with the int return type and as you see right here, it returns zero. The syntax of the return type, the return keyword, are going to be some of the things that we are going to be focusing on. So as far as one of the things that might be curious or interesting for people coming from other languages to know is that in C++ there are two names for blocks of executable code. We have functions and we have member functions or what are called methods. And a method is going to always be attached to a class. So for example, we talked last week about our string object. We briefly mentioned that string is a class, and we can make objects out of it. By saying stir dot, what we do is we access all the members on that object. These are all what are called methods. And they're methods because they're attached to a particular object at runtime. However, in C++, it is possible to create functions that are not attached at all to a... Um, to a class, unlike other languages like Java or C Sharp, where all you have are methods. An example of that would be main itself. Main is not attached whatsoever into uh, a particular class. Same with a few methods or functions that we might have been using already, such like such as gitline. Uh, gitline, if you remember from last class, simply uh, gets a line of text from a particular uh, iStream object, and CN is an iStream object and it assigns that data to our string that we pass in. Now this is an example of a function because it is not attached whatsoever to an object. So functions are going to be what we're going to be talking about, how to create our own functions. One of the reasons we might want to create our own functions is going to be uh, for kind of factoring out commonly used code. So it's really important to be able to to do that for well a variety of reasons. Programming is really just about uh, defining some reusable bit of logic and then using that logic in some way to produce a result. So for example, we might have a, uh, we might for example have uh, a code like this. So in the case of this bit of code, we have some, some functionality that's reused twice, and it's very similar functionality. So how would we go about breaking this out into its own bit of logic that we can reuse over and over again? The easiest way to do that is going to be using a function. So let's go ahead and, and code a function really quickly and talk about how we can, well, use it to get a result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another function. I'm going to say, call it get string, and it's going to take in a string prompt. And we're going to be talking about every bit of this syntax here very shortly. 
it's going to see out the prompt followed by a colon, and then it's going to have a string temp variable. We're going to invoke get line with sin, and let's go ahead and return our temp variable. So now this code can simply become this. We can remove these two lines of repetitious code and we can replace them with an invocation of our new function. So I can say, enter your first name and then enter your last name. And when I run this program, actually, well, I could also actually do some output. <laughs> your name is first name, last name, sin.ignore, sin.get. Okay, so enter my first name, enter my last name, and it says your name is Nelson LeKay. So what we've in effect, well, what we've done is we've abstracted some code, and the code does look a little bit more complicated, especially if you are new to the concept of what a function is. Um, but hopefully everybody can kind of see here in lines 15 and 16 how we took some code that could have been a, a variety of lines long. It could have been, uh, could have required a lot of processing, but we've, we've named that code and reused it in two situations. So we've factored out a bit of repetitious code. See, I don't know. I don't know if it's just because I'm coming from C Sharp, but I look at that and, and I'm, I can see why you do that, but I, I, why wouldn't it, why, why is it better to have that as a, a separate, just free floating thing than to have it in a nice safe place like a class? It, that's just how it works in C++. Um, Generally in C++, uh, it depends on how your how, what your coding style is, but but typically you will be spending most of your time in objects and in classes. Um, so is there's no, I mean, is there a difference in terms of overheads? No, um, not particularly. If it's in or out of a, I mean, no. So when would you choose to use a a member function rather than not, or vice versa? Mm, often I wouldn't. Often I, I, I would place this this method as, for example, in a in a class, and I would have this be a static member within that class. Um, but that could partially be due to the fact that um, I mean, I just that's that's my preference, um, and it yeah. provides more delineation as far as uh, you know conflicts and other things. But just uh, basic. I mean, just think of this right now as we're in we're, everything is inside of a static program class for right now. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so someone did bring up something that I was going to point out, which is very important. This function, and I am going to go over the syntax of the function here very shortly, but I do really want to point out for anybody who's following along, this function is defined and, de or declared and defined above where it's being used. Um, I beforehand. Yes, this is very important. C++ is, uh, the order of where members appear is very, very important. Um, and the reason for that is is partially historical. Uh, you know, a long time ago when C++ was created, having a compiler that can keep every bit of your code in memory at one time wasn't feasible. So as a result, uh, having to forward declare things became uh, became a very important sort of thing so that compilers could uh, could not have to be more complicated because it would be more complicated for a compiler to be able to not have to forward declare this function. So it is a is sort of historical thing, but it is a property of C++ that you will always have to keep in mind that you may not ever use a function or a member or anything before it's defined within a CPP file. And we are going to be talking about how CPP files work. We are going to be talking about the linker today. The linker is a is one of those scary things that, that a lot of people don't get the experience of learning about early on, but it's going to be very, very important to people's understandings of how forward declarations actually work. Um, the main function is so our entry point. 
Is this defined the C++ specification or does the compiler define the special main function? Uh, the C++ specification names int main as the entry point and as the only valid entry point into our application. That is something uh, baked into the standard and thankfully so. <laughs> Otherwise it would be intense. Um, so what namespaces get stringing? Uh, it's not in namespace. We are going to be talking about namespaces uh, probably. I'm probably going to keep the order. Okay. Uh, or I am kind of jumping around on the order, but I do want to keep namespaces here at the end. But we will be talking about how to define our own namespaces and the global namespace. And the anonymous namespace, which is an also a, an important aspect of code. Okay, so... What this is doing, what this code is doing, is you'll notice if I go ahead and set a breakpoint on line 15, and I'm not going to hit F10. Uh, I do remember saying that you generally don't, you, you want to stay away from the step, uh, step into uh, button or F11 inside of Visual Studio when you're just learning C++ unless you know what you're doing because you may inadvertently step into the implementation of, I don't know, the sh bitwise shift operators on the Cout object. But in this case I am going to hit F11 and F11 is going to show us where execution goes um, when this line of code executes. So when I hit F11, oh come on, okay well that was a bad example. And the reason That's that was a bad example is because I jumped into the constructor of string. <laughs> so please forgive me. I'm going to go ahead and break this code apart a little bit. Okay, so now I'm going to set a breakpoint on line 18 here. And the first thing that's going to happen is we are going to evaluate um, this expression. And this expression is a function invocation. So it's, it's similar to our function invocation, or method invocations here, like sin.ignore and sin.get, and our, our other function invocation right here, like get line. What happens when I hit F11 is, again, it's really wanting to step into this horrible looking, oh, come on. <laughs> Jump out, out. I said out, 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 out of that, out of that, out of that. There we go. So when we hit F11, uh, now that we've gotten past the uh, the uh, assignment operator for the string, we jump into the get string method because this method or this function because this function is going to go ahead and uh, get invoked at some point uh, when the string uh, class is done doing its stuff. And it's going to go ahead and, um, oh, actually, never mind. What I was jumping into, I just, I just totally, the, the reason I, I completely forgot about this behavior was because, um, well, I'm used to uh, C sharp and C sharp strings are primitives. But if anybody's curious, uh, what I jumped into when I hit F11 was the assignment of this constant pointer to this string parameter. So the code code actually executed, uh, the, the string constructor actually executed here to copy this data into this, into this parameter. But what are parameters? So when I jump into this code, and yeah. you what? Oh, I was going to say, yeah, somebody did point out you should just put the breakpoint on line 7. Yeah. Okay, so what we have here is we're sitting here inside the get string method, and you'll notice some really interesting things. First of all, we have a parameter that's actually filled in with some important data that we, that we specified at the call site. And second of all, the, the, the function executes just like normal until it hits this return keyword, in which case it, it it takes the data that was assigned to this variable and assigns it to whatever we assigned uh, the, the function invocation expression into. So to talk about really quickly about the syntax of how the function is defined, the first bit is going to be the return type, just like how main returns an integer. Get string returns a string. The second bit is the name. Just how main is, well, main. Uh, get string is named get string. 
the final part of the of, of the the definite or declaration of the the function function we have the parameter list and the parameter list specifies data that can be made accessible to our function by the caller of the function so in this case what we've done is we've said that the caller is required to send in a string whenever get string is invoked will force them to send in a string and they have no option to do so uh, they have no option to not do so. Um, and when they provide that data, this variable here, this parameter, gets filled with whatever argument that was specified. So here's a bit of terminology for you guys. This is a parameter because this, this variable here is named a parameter because it is a required bit of information that the call site must provide. When the call site does provide this information, so the call site here being on line 18, this is called an argument. We are passing an argument of uh, the string literal, enter your first name, into the parameter of string prompt. So when this, when this function executes, this data is available to it, and the function can use this data in any way that it sees appropriate. So for example, we, see, we uh, print that out to the console followed by a colon. Now what is actually getting passed there? You mean as far as string prompt? Yeah, what is being passed in? Is it the actual ob object? Yes. What happens here is the C++ compiler generates instructions that will convert your arguments into the types that were expected by the parameters. And in order to do this conversion, what's, what happens here is string has a special constructor that takes in a, uh, a string literal. So the C, the C++ generates right here at this point uh, invocation of the string's constructor informing it that we want to convert this string literal into a string object. Then what it does is it copies that string from the get string uh, call site into this parameter. Now this is a copy. I really want to point this out. In C++... That's a different piece of memory altogether. Yes, entirely. In C++, you do not have the ability to delineate your types as reference or value types. So what I mean by that is whether or not a type uh, is passed by value or by reference is not up to the type itself, but is up to how you use it. And of course, once we start talking about pointers and references, then we'll get into how we can pass things by reference. But know right now that the data we're passing in to get string is actually going to be a instantiated string object that gets initialized to this string literal, or more appropriately, the, uh, the constructor of the string gets invoked given the string literal. And then the data of that string gets copied into this prompt parameter. So, in fact, that's that's exemplified by the need for temp, presumably, in the get string uh, function. How do you mean? Uh, or am I just? Hang on, am I reading that backwards? Uh, the the temp. I'm just trying to come up with an example of where it why. It's essentially where you need to return a string out rather right. than just playing with prompt, is what I was aiming to say. Yeah, there's no, um, there's no way to, in C++ without using references or pointers, to actually mutate data like that. Um, uh, to, uh, so data is passed by value. Almost always, well, it is always passed by value, except in the cases where it's not. And the cases where it's not are, are going to be situations where you explicitly, in your method or in your function signature, specify that data should be passed by reference and not by value. Is, there, is, who, is, is anyone feeling incredibly lost by this whole issue of passing by reference, passing by value? Because it is quite a tricky one to get your head around exactly where the, what the difference is, where the different, difference lies. Um, sorry, I mean it can be. But speak, speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, well I can cut up a different example really quickly to sort of talk more about, um, talk a little bit more about functions. Probably should have started out with a, with a simpler method or function uh, definition. We can talk about the consequences of 
the behavior we get in C++, which is going to be by default, things are passed by value. And we're not going to be talking about references or pointers in this class. This is, uh, this, I, I'm only getting into this discussion as a way to sort of solidify um, uh, some concepts about the difference between reference and values before we actually get into how to create our own. Otherwise, people in that future class will be incredibly lost instead of just mostly lost. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and talk about a simpler example here. So I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to introduce the void keyword. And the void keyword specifies that the return type of a function is nothing. And void does not have a value in C++, and it's impossible to assign anything to void. So let's go ahead and give this a name. Let's call this, this, this function, I don't know, get int. And by this he didn't mean he's assigning it to nothing, just in case there's any lack of clarity there. It literally, there is none. There is no return type. It, it, it doesn't, it, it, you can't. This is void. Well, just to clarify. Okay, so what's going on here is we have declared another function. And people should really get used to this sort of syntax where we have our, our function signature, which specifies its return type, its name, and its uh, parameter list, followed by its body, which is going to be very similar to the body in uh, main because it's just a collection of statements. Now you'll notice... Um, why is it taking in a number? You'll see. Oh, okay. Um, Sorry, but, uh, I, <laughs> I was just looking at that going, why is that taking a number in? But, okay, I can see where you're going. In some of the languages, a function with no return type is known as a procedure, but in C++, they're still called functions. Yes. Um, these are still called functions. They're just functions that return void. So what's going on here is we are creating a function that has uh, this signature that returns nothing and takes in an int parameter. Uh, inside we have the body of the function which simply prints out a prompt and then assigns the number into something. Um, is it an acceptable programming practice to put a semicolon at the end of functions? Uh, this will still compile, uh, but I think it's silly to do that. Uh, I think that looks gross, and um, I don't often see this being done. Now, this is the required syntax when defining structures or classes inside of C++, but it is not required when defining functions or methods. So I do not at all recommend that people place uh, an extraneous semicolon at the end of functions. Okay, so what's going on here is we have our bit of reusable logic right here, and it basically it's just going to be two statements here on line seven, seven and eight. And um, let's go ahead and say that uh, I'm going to go ahead and add a sin dot ignore and sin dot get, and then say I'm going to sign this to zero. And so people who are completely new to programming, I really want uh, them to answer this question, or at least try to. Um, and again, just like normal, if, I, if you know that I know that you know the answer to this, then don't answer. But uh, for people who are completely new, when I hit enter, uh, what do you think the output of this program is going to be? And this is going to be a very, this is going to present a very important a uh, bit of behavior in regards to how functions work. And any, anyone in need of a clue, I refer you to my earlier faux pas. So when I hit enter, it says my number is zero. And the reason this is happening is because the way functions work is they cop they will by default just copy all the data that we provide it into the actual function that we invoke it with. This is the behavior functions that I really want people to to exploit for the next this week and next week. And the reason is, is I really uh, 
because we don't really want to get into pointers and references at this point, but I really want to stress that this is sort of uh, a, a function of good function design is going to be, uh, well, using functions properly. And the correct answer to get this program to perform the, the operation that we want is not to turn this into a reference, but instead to do something else. And that's where we're going to talk about return types. So basically, if I, ba if I invert this program where get int returns an integer, it establishes a temp variable. So what I've effectively done is I've swapped uh, how things work with this function. So this function takes in no parameters now and it returns an integer. And as a result, right here on line 10, we, speci we specify the return keyword followed by a, uh, a value. And in this case, this value is an expression that simply references an identifier that is attached to an integer variable. So when I hit a 5 type in a number, we get the expected result. Cool. So and um, sorry, are you just doing it for clarity, or is it not possible to do return C in? That it's it the if the expression or the expression the type of the expression returned, or the type of the expression returned right here of course. is not going to be appropriate. It's going to be a um, it's going to be trying to return an I stream. Sorry, me being dumb. So, yeah. So that's a, that's a function, uh, or that's functions and how return types are used. I mean, uh, so do I not need to specify parameters? Yes. Uh, just like how you don't need to specify a return type, you do not need to specify parameters. But you are free to specify as many parameters as you wish. So, for example, I could specify a uh, string prompt. and simply replace this with that. And now when I invoke this function, I can simply pass in enter a number. And by hitting F5, uh, well, that was a bad example, <laughs> uh, we get 423, four, just like before. So um, yeah, so parameters and return types are really important to get to to think about um, because they're the inputs and outputs to a function. Uh, typically, w what a function does is it, is it should encapsulate some bit of of properly reusable code throughout your program. But in addition, it's also very important for functions to sort of delineate the uh, the parts of your program into well named areas. So, yeah. Are there any questions about functions in general at this point? Uh, when we return something, is the value copied followed by the local variables being destroyed? Yes. Um, what this will do is the return keyword is going to... Um, is going to uh, simply, well, return this data to whoever invoked the getInt method. Every other bit of data within the getInt method is removed. It's removed from the stack. So I know we've been talking a bit about stack frames, and this could be a, a good time to sit down and, and talk about how stack frames are actually um, actually put together. But I would want to answer some more um, some more general questions about functions before I do that. Yeah. What's the preferred casing for function names? Um, I have C++ is a much older language and it's used much more broadly than uh, than other languages. And so as a result, my mouse just decided to freak out again. Uh, now my mouse is locked on my other. There we go. I don't know what that was. Huh? Um, so C++ has been around a lot longer, used in a lot more scenarios, and as a result has a lot of different um, uh, naming conventions that, that, that could be considered valid. Um, 
I won't knock people for using uh, lowercase uh, or camel case for their function names uh, because that is a very common uh, naming scheme that I've seen in C++ code. Uh, same goes for classes. However, that being said, I do personally prefer Pascal cased function names and Pascal cased class names. And doesn't main have to be lowercase? It does, yes. I mean the method, the uh, uh, function yeah. main, not the, yeah. Uh, is there a main purpose for just time saving on typing or do they provide extra functionality? Um, time saved typing. Uh, well, imagine that you had, you know, a, a, a program that's 200,000 lines long and that's a small program. Um, you won't be able to get very far by just using main and that's just how things work. Functions not only allow you to delineate uh, your code into little packages, but they also allow you to transcend file barriers, which means we will be able to place this into another file entirely and get the benefit of actually separating our logic out in a more organized way. Um, as far as functionality that, that functions provide versus saving typing, um, one of the most important aspects of a function is that by editing the, the implementation of a function, we edit the code that's invoked every specific time that a function is invoked. So for example, get int, if I had invoked this, this function 20 times in my program and I decided that the, the implementation here, maybe I wanted to add input validation to get int, which could be a, a fairly long bit of um, uh, a bit of code. And by providing that in a function, we can provide that functionality to every invoker of the get int method or get int function. I really want people to you or to get used to using functions because it's it's going to be very important. In fact, we are going to start imposing a, a length of function requirements. Um, because, well, that will force it people just encourages, to... Yeah, I mean, it encourages you to, well, yeah, absolutely force people to have a better architecture to their code and think about the structure of the code, which is something that it can be hard to focus on when you're starting out by nature of the fact that you tend to be doing quite straightforward problems. Like here, if int name was, was you know, if, if, that, if you'd been set the problem to come up with what is now showing on the screen, um, really and truly, you don't need that function at all. You could just do it all in main. And so it's very hard to see the benefit of it. But, you know, say you were doing that and you had to get, you know, a thousand different numbers. You wouldn't want to be typing that out over and over and over and over again. And also, you know, if <clears throat> now that you're passing in a prompt, you're not limited to saying enter a number. You could change it. You know, you could use the same method but pass in a, a different prompt. Uh, you know, it's, uh, again, it's, it's, it's buzzwords, but it comes back to reusability and um, better structure. There have been a few people asking about Pascal and Camel case um, and what they are, essentially. Yeah, uh, Pascal case is going to be uh, a casing scheme that starts with an uppercase and every other word is, is uh, lowercase with the except, or every other character is lowercase with the exception of other um, characters that begin a word within the string or within the identifier. Whereas camel casing is what we'll typically use for uh, local variables where we start with the lowercase and then again the same sort of deal where the beginning of every word is uppercase. Um, have we covered whether C++ has access modifiers? Access modifiers are only appropriate for object-oriented programming, which we will be getting into week seven. So yes. Can you specify auto as the return type? No. And parameter types? No. Nope. You cannot... If you think about it, there's no way it would know what to return necessarily if you did. You have to specify explicitly. Hello? Hello? Sorry, you just appeared to have gone. No, I'm here. Um, 
but yes, you can't do anything about that. Um, but you, what you can do, you can use templates, but we're not going to be talking about templates. Um, okay. So, any more questions? Um, what do you well, need? Yep. You are? Johan asked, what happens if I send an int into a function but it only needs double, for example? Uh, C++ is just going to do its thing. It's going to do its uh, implicit conversion. So, for example, um, we could have a method called void display double. Or w which way? Okay, so it was this way. Double D, and then we can say, see out, this is a double D. And then what we can do is we can say display double, and we can pass in an int we can pass in a float, we could pass in a character, and by running this code, well, I always forget to add the stupid new line. We get this behavior. What, what's happening here is we are getting the behavior of implicit conversion. See, C++ is going to do its best to identify at compile time the type of a parameter and the type of the argument you're trying to fill that parameter with. And it'll do its best to do a conversion between the two. So just as you saw a literal string got converted into a string object, the same thing happens here where a literal int gets converted into a double. However, presumably, well, what, uh, see, I'm no, not sure of anything anymore now that we're talking about C++. What happens if you had a display int method and you tried to pass it in a double? We'll get a warning. A warning? Yes. So as you see, we did get a warning, uh, conversion from double to int, conversion from float to int, um, but it let us do that. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, are we going to cover out and ref in this class? There is no such thing as out and ref in C++. Um, there are references and pointer pointers. <laughs> yes, there are pointer pointers. And there are pointer, 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 pointers, but those are less useful. Um, but we are going to be covering those once we start talking about pointers and references. Uh, but there is no out and ref keyword in C++. They just don't exist. And James's question probably leads us on quite nicely. Yes, so... Um, Right now we see how we have different functions, and different functions are simply named blocks of code that can accept input um, in the form of parameters and provide output in the form of return types. But there are a few important things about, um, about functions that are interesting to note. And one of them is the, is the concept of overloading. So for example, if I were to name these methods the same, What do we get? Yeah. So does anybody... So what, what happens here is these two functions are named the same thing, but they have a different parameter list, meaning they, it's acceptable for us to do this. Now, this isn't something that's possible in C, but it is in C++, which is really nice. Um, it also has a lot of consequences, at least as far as name mangling goes, but whatever. Um, but what we have here is uh, two functions that take in a different list of parameters. And the compiler is going to choose which one of these overloads, they're called overloads, is most appropriate to invoke at compile time. So when we go ahead and hit a 5, you'll notice something interesting. We get This is an int 432, because the int literal appropriately matched the int parameter. So it was the, this out of this function group, this overload was the most appropriate. But here we have a float being passed in. And the most appropriate overload for that is going to be the double, because the compiler knows that it can convert from a float to a double without losing precision. 
Then we jump back to a character constant. Remember, a character constant is just an integer value representing the ASCII code. So its most appropriate overload is going to be the integer. And then we have a display double, and because this is a double literal, the most appropriate one is going to be the one defined on line 5. Uh, then we have a display float, which is again line 5. And then we have another display character, which is going to be an integer. We did have a question come in. Is it really a good idea to let the compiler decide? It, it, yeah. Uh, it depends on what you're going for. Yeah. Um, well, assume, assuming that you have cr done the necessary... Uh, if you, as provided you didn't just have this is a number written in both of those. Um, you know, provided you've, you've provided... Oh, dear. Given that you've provided... <laughs> the proper functionality within the different overloads of the method, then it's an excellent idea because that way you don't actually have to worry as you're coding along which overload to choose. You pass in what you want to pass in and get out what you expect to get out given whatever type you pass in. Did that make sense as a sentence? Uh, kind of. Okay, so, yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Okay, um, can you change the return type when overloading a particular function? You can, actually. As you see, I've just, I've, I have, well, I've changed the return type depending on the overload. And that is an appropriate way to work with stuff. So, yeah. Um, and this would be an apposite moment to point out that the other thing you should probably change by now is the name of the method of the, I'm going to be doing that a lot, the name of the functions. Yeah, but these functions suck they, anyway, because they do. They do, <laughs> but, but it is a, it's a point worth making. Now, they're not just displaying. Right, these are two. And this is something, it's, you know, I'm, I shouldn't be arguing this with you. You should be immediately on my side about this. <laughs> naming, naming your functions properly. Because if you come back to this in a few days' time, having fiddled around with other things, and see display being called, you're going to expect it to be displaying things. You're not going to expect the number that gets returned to be the square of the number that you put in. Right. And, um, I mean, no, I completely agree with that. The only uh, thing that I would say that these functions just suck in general and I'm about to nuke them. <laughs> but, I know, uh, but I wanted to bang but, that drum. Just yeah, yeah. It is, it's very important to think about, uh, think about your uh, well, It's also these sort of things where... You do do minor changes of functionality like this. Obviously, not as as um, <laughs> facile as that, but it's very easy to think. Oh yeah, and at the end of this session, I'll go back and make a pass and do and do all my naming, and that is like backing up your hard drive or cleaning out the dust from inside your computer. These things have never been done. It's just it never you never get the time. So yeah. Do it when you do it when you do it is is what I'm. Yeah. Anyway, go on, teach. Okay, so uh, da -da. would placing string display call, create a problem? No, you can return strings if you want to. Of course, this code is no longer going to compile because uh, D times D is a double, and a double is not convertible into a string. However, we could return a, a string literal if we wanted to, but in this case, we're just returning a string literal that's implicitly convertible into a string type. With the int version? Uh, the int version, uh, no, it doesn't like it. No. Okay, so uh, I do want to make one, I, I, a few more points here um, before I guess we go on break. But I do want to make a few more points about op well, or method or function overloading. Oh, excellent, yeah. 
Um, so let's say we have an int get int method with a, that takes in a string prompt. And No, I'm just gonna go ahead and run you should, it. You should get them to. Ah, uh, yeah, but you should get them to um, methodize that. Methodize. All right, functionalize. You see where I'm going with this, though, right? Yeah, I think so. I don't know if I'm. But anyway, so the the what I'm I, I do really quickly want to ask: Are there any more questions about this syntax? About the fact that we have a named bit of code that takes an input and provides output. Um, I will be going over a few more rules about returns here pr very shortly. But in a very simple case where we don't have any control flow, uh, is everybody more or less good? What's control flow? Uh, ifs and whiles and fors and. Everything seems to be good. Okay, so the last thing I want to point out about overloads is that, remember the only thing that I specified about overloads was that they don't, um, they just have to di differ in their parameter list. Meaning we can use them to specify a default parameter for a get int method. Actually, <laughs> uh, this code won't compile. Any guesses as to why this code won't compile? You no, know it's what? not about. I haven't, I haven't got the faintest. What are people saying in Buzznet? They're saying something about the string and in conversion. There's no, there's no problem with the string to in conversion because this met, this function is different from this function. This function returns oh. an integer, and it accepts a string. Meaning, saying get get return get int. This is going to simply evaluate this function and return an integer, providing a proper return value for get int. So it has nothing to do with types. I think someone's got it. Okay. So uh, when I try to compile, you'll notice I get this error, which is a very awesome error that just shows you how um, how not intelligent the C++ compilers at some at some points, and something you'll have to look at or uh, be aware of as you look at errors from C++. Notice how it says git int function does not take one argument. And you're sat there going, yes, it does. I'm looking at it. I can see it. <laughs> and Yeah, now that's, that's horrible. The reason it doesn't is because the order it's defined in. So now I get a properly compiling program. And now instead of saying get int L LHS and get int RHS, I can now invoke the parameterless overload of this function. So the order is really important. We're going to be talking about prototypes uh, very shortly here. Um, I do want to point out that there is, there are default arguments in C++, and a default argument may have been more appropriate in this case, but I don't want to talk about default arguments quite yet, and I did want to actually pull out an a example of uh, an overload. Yeah, well, that beat me. Yeah. I, I completely couldn't work that out. Well done, SL Stark, who clearly knew the answer. You um, oh, so I'm, I'm going to sulk for the rest of the lesson. That's it. I'm not talking to you anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's like question 12. <laughs> anyway, anyway, 
So I'm not sure what happened with the order. The order is very important in C++. The C++ compiler will evaluate your CPP files line by line, meaning they are not, it is not aware of anything that you do not make it aware of. So in this case, when I was invoking the overload of git int, which IntelliSense helpfully tells me is valid, <laughs> um, the, it's actually not valid because the overload that I'm invoking right now, the git int string overload, which is defined on line 10, is actually defined lower than when I tried to actually invoke the function. And I might have actually accidentally said method a few times in that. Yeah, I'm probably not helping your cause there. No, uh, it's, I mean, I... I do it all the, it's, yeah. Yeah. The ironic, particularly ironic thing being is it, it, it means it's, you end up in exactly the opposite order to that which you like. Yeah. <laughs> and I like as well. The parameters, more parameters after this. Yuri A appears possibly to still be confused with two functions with the same name. Yep. These two functions are the same name, and this is valid code because their parameter list differs. Parameter list, that was. Continue. It just sounded like parameter list. Oh, yes, parameter list. As a result, I can, I can now optionally specify a string parameter or argument. So I can not provide a string argument in one and provide a string argument in another. Different functions get invoked depending on if I do fill in that list. But now that I hit a five, you'll notice the first one will say enter an int and the second one will say RHS. Which, if you people aren't familiar, I use that uh, convention quite frequently. Uh, RHS uh, it stands for right hand side. Uh, just like LHS stands for left hand side. So I'll use that quite frequently. But it's not, it's not just the number of parameters that matters, it's the type of the parameters as well. Um, yes. Uh, so you could have a get int that takes in an int as well and multiplies. <clears throat> or it could have any number of parameters. It will still know the difference. Does it identify correctly if they've got the same parameter list but different return types? No. Uh, you can't that. overload based off return types, period. Funny enough, you can't in C Sharp either, but you can in intermediate language. So if you handwrite your IL, you can actually overload based off return type. But you can't do that in C I, Sharp. Sharp. I always thought I that was funny. I never can remember whether you can or not. Yeah, in C Sharp you can't, but that's just a, a restriction on the language itself. Uh, we're not going to be quite looking at recursion, I don't think. I mean, we, we could uh, we could look at recursion. That'd be a great thing to talk about in regards to stack frames, which we're going to be talking about. But we're not going to be just yet. I want to get through a lot of stuff from the syllabus before we go down a path that might der derail the class. It really does feel to me with, with the whole thing, the basics of C++ are a lot less basic than the basics of C Sharp. Well, yes. Okay, so I'm going to... You need to know a lot more to get to the same point. Yeah, pretty much. And even now, because we don't even know what references are pointers yet, we are still very limited. Um, well, I'll tell you what, we've been going for probably yeah. nearly an hour now. Do you want to set them something to do? Uh, I don't know. You could get them to make a nice uh, set of uh, operator methods. Add, subtract. Yeah. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pause the video, and then I'm going to step outside. Um, before I do step away, I just resume the video. Uh, we got a question. How do you pass in multiple parameters? And if you go ahead and... Um, if you kind of take a stab at it, you'll notice that uh, in this case, I've sort of represented these arguments uh, delineated by a comma, and that's going to be how you delineate different parameters. So for example, I can say int a, int b, double c, string f. So go ahead and write add subtraction, division, and multiplication methods. 
um, with appropriate return types and overloads. Oh, method. And then, uh, yes, it's functions. <laughs> And if you're doing this, uh, please click the participate button so yep. we can see who's participating. And uh, if you're not participating, grab coffee so that we can keep bashing away at this after the break. Yep. Yeah. So resuming, uh, let's go ahead and talk about how we can get these uh, these functions to work. So let's go ahead and start with the int overload to each one of these functions. So the first one, I'm going to go ahead and add create an add function. That takes in two int parameters, int left-hand side and int right-hand side. And simply going to return left-hand side plus right-hand side. Basically, the structure of each one of these functions is going to be incredibly similar. So we'll have a mol, a div, a dov, a div, and a sub. And the multiplication will multiply, the div will divide, and the sub will subtract. That's how we would get uh, each one of these int methods to work properly, where we have each one of these int methods that take in two parameters and return a result. So far, so good. Do you want to? Do you actually want to make the div one the fourth one in the list, and then you can deal with it, you know, so on its own merits. Now I'm going to copy and paste all these again, and then I'm going to change the the types. I'm going to say double add double mole, double sub, and double div. You, Gavin? Yeah, I was just pondering whether to say anything or not. So, did... Did anybody up to this, up to there, those few methods? Um, did anyone struggle to come up with essentially this or something similar? In this exercise, the, these functions seem pointless, but the exercise was more or less about constructing functions and getting the syntax down. And, uh, you know, somebody somewhere at some point had to write these math methods, and they've been written on many occasions. And also, I mean, this isn't, I mean, we could get into some really interesting stuff with bit shift operators, but um, there's still, well, there's, there's one, what I, I would, there's one definite problem that occurs twice, and then there's one kind of what I'd call a, more of a gotcha to do with these. Um, do you want to... Would you want to show the... explain the definite problem? Well, I mean, the definite problem is going to be the divide by zero. Yeah. Um, and then we can talk about the other one in a minute. Uh, the, the fact is, you try to divide by zero and you're going to get a runtime error. That being said, these functions, I do not want uh, people to worry about um, catching that error. And the reason is, is because we don't have at this point any proper functionality here to deal with the case in which the right-hand side is zero, meaning allowing the error to crash our program is actually the most appropriate um, action to take because the validation to ensure that RHS is never zero is not the responsibility of the divide method because, again, the divide method does not have an appropriate step does not have the appropriate behavior to take in the case of RHS being zero. However, the method or the function invoking the divide function does. And for example, if we wanted to accept user input, we could say, you know, see out, uh, enter RHS. So I have int RHS, int LHS. And then C in RHS. At this point, and of course I did it backwards again. Amazing, isn't it? At this point, we would do the validation here. We'd say if RHS equals zero, then C out, you fail. 
because also we're not doing any we're not actually doing any validation that the they're properly being used, you know, that it's probably being passed an int in the, or a double in the first place. Here, where you're using them with, with um, user input, you could be getting any old rubbish, frankly. Yeah. And frequently will. And see, the thing about input validation in C++ is it is a very complicated thing that re re that involves talking a lot about streams. So uh, we're not talking about it. We've, we've avoided talking about input validation thus far, and we're going to continue to do so until we have a nice block of time. Uh, maybe in our in our next uh, class, once we start talking more about streams, will be an appropriate time to uh, talk about input validation. Yeah. Although I would just point out, due to, as, as Mohammed just said, you, you, you would actually want to make that if only happen if you are dividing. Correct. Um, but there is a gotcha in here as well, um, aside from any question of input validation. Uh, can you give an example that will show that you can then ask them about what, what they expect to see? <laughs> I'm just trying to ask you without giving away. Uh, I'm not sure what... It... Are you with me? Or I can type into the uh, questions thing. Mm. Um. Oh, right. Well, uh, basically, any time that we do integer division, uh, I don't know if we pointed this out earlier, but I guess now is a good time ending to talk about it. <laughs> well, so much, but I could have just said it then. <laughs> I was going to get you to ask. Come on, you've got to... You've got a. This is a live class. We've got an audience. Use use them. Use these users. Use them in back at them. Um, also, and what's division? Div division. Oh wait! Don't even think about starting with me about my typing. <laughs> I was doing that in a hurry. Just you wasted in the first place. <laughs> okay. So um, yeah. So what's going on here is integer division will always going. It's going to go ahead and always truncate the the decimal point or the. Uh, the fractional component of the expression, and that's because integers are incapable of storing fractional units. So as a result, if I were to, for example, divide, uh, let's say... Five by two. Yeah, five by two, we'll get two, even though the more appropriate answer might be 2.5. So... Uh, well, see, now, the correct answer <clears throat> mathematically would be 2.5. The most appropriate answer mathematically, and this is a key point to bear in mind, would be three. Correct. We are we are um, truncating the the int uh, the the number to make it into an int. We're not rounding. Yep. So now that we have all of these um, all of these overloads, to talk a little bit about how we can invoke the different overloads. If all I did was change the type of LHS and RHS to a double, we'll get radically different results. Because now, if I do five divided by two you'll notice I get 2.5. Um, why does divide um, by zero... Yeah. Why does divide by zero crash instead of giving zero? Because it's not mathematically possible to divide by zero. Dividing by zero doesn't give zero. It gives infinity. You can't do it. It's not allowed by the universe. Yes. And so... And programming is a subset of the universe. So it's still not allowed. But wouldn't it be easier to let divide function handle the division by zero, even if it's not the responsibility of the divide function? No. It is still appropriate in this case to allow the error to crash our program. The reason it is, is because this operation, if RHS is zero, then we have a problem. And the problem is not with this code. The problem is not with anything that divide is responsible for. The problem is whoever invoked divide got improper input, incorrect input, and it's not the responsibility of the divide function to do anything but crash the program if it was given improper input. Now, because that really is that really is the right answer to dividing by zero. Anything divided by zero is is broken, right? Because it, it's infinity, which isn't which isn't a number. And as a result, we want to divide, we want, if somebody misuses a function, we want the program to crash. We want to be made aware of that error. 
So the responsibility lies not with the divide function itself, but with the code that handles the user input. And that's a very important thing about functions to talk about is the responsibilities of the functions. In this, in this program, with this architecture, we see that the responsibility of user input lies solely with the main function. And the responsibility of performing the mathematical operations is solely in the hands of these different functions up here. Okay, so is everybody good with operator overloading, return types, or not operator overloading, um, function overloading, return types, and parameters? Are there any more questions about this? Because then we can move on to maybe talking about some uh, variable scope and some prototyping. Well, some, uh, one person did uh, point up a slight gap, which is what happens if you pass in 3.5 and 1? Oh, that's a good question. Say to any of your, uh, yes, you should ask it. If I pass in 3.3 and then 2, notice how 3.3 is a double, whereas 2 is an integer. What we're going to go ahead and get is instead of the behavior we would typically expect from languages, um, certain languages like C Sharp, which, which would uh, appropriately invoke the double overload of divide, uh, C++ will actually throw a little error at compile time. It'll say two overloads have similar conversions. Because it doesn't have in the specification a lot of logic in regards to, well, it has a lot of logic in regards to conversions, but not necessarily the appropriateness of particular conversions, what we have here is a situation that's impossible to invoke. Wow. Man, there are. Uh, <laughs> it can't tell. I'm. <laughs> Dumbfounded by that. That's <laughs> astonishing. So how do we fix the problem? Well, we fix the problem by not passing in an integer literal. We fix the problem by ha passing an integer. Um, an <laughs> integer. Not. So, for example, Sh show them show them how you would actually fix the problem if you still want to pass two in. Let's let's break this. Let's make this a little bit more um, real world first. Well, yes, but it, 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 you would have just added a point zero, right, for so the for the to, constant to get to make it into right. So what what I did now, I, but in this is a more common scenario though when we have variables themselves and not uh, literals. The way that you would approach solving this problem, if you wanted the double overload to be invoked, we would cast LHS to a double, and this code would work. If we wanted the int overload to be invoked, we would cast the right-hand side to integer. Would it work if we passed in a float and a double? So something like this. And this is going to go ahead and work because, the, because this is a float, it is no longer, uh, it's no longer, not appropriate, but it's no longer desirable to turn this into an integer. And because it's no longer desirable to convert this into an integer, um, it's going to look for the next most appropriate overload. But if we had, for example, something like this, we would start getting in trouble again. We would have the same error because now this parameter matches this parameter exactly, but this parameter does not match this parameter exactly. So in C++, would you do what Johan is, is, is asking about, which is, would you, if you were doing this, would you have to implement overloads that had one of each? No, I would not do that. I would, I would do what you see right here. I mean, assuming you were writing, you know, a class library or... I would, I would not do that. I would, at the call site, I would specify using casting which of the overloads I'm expecting to happen. Okay, so... Somebody asked, how do you declare a function to an ex accept an array? That's going to be a fun one. Oh, is it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I would have skipped over it if I don't know that. Um, basically, 
Well, if we're going to be covering, if we, if it's past what we should be covering, I thought that I didn't realise it was going to be a complicated answer. Well, I mean, it's C++. Yeah, this is, I just assumed it would be a question of, of changing the type to an array type. The declaration of the function. Yeah, you would typically, so, okay, so moving on from this, is every, does any, do anybody, does uh, words and stuff and things and code and C++ overloading functions, pointers, references, templates, um, does anybody... All the right words, <laughs> not necessarily in the right order. <laughs> Does anybody have any more questions about overloading now? Oh, and at this point I'd just like to say, NATO! Actually, it was hilarious. We were, we were chatting on Skype the other day, and I idly jumped into Modern Warfare 3 while we were talking, because I, I do that because Modern Warfare 3 doesn't really require any high level of thought. Because interacting with other people makes you frustrated, so you go and shoot things. <laughs> but about ten minutes into it, um, NATO made a comment like he was in the same game that I was, and it turned out he was, and I'd killed him like ten times as I was talking to him without realizing it. It was actually... Oh, fun. you're so lead. That was, no, that was funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> um, okay. No questions have come in, so I, it seems that we've managed to make all those words make sense. Sweet. So show us something cool. Well, I do want to point out that we are going to have to deal with passing arrays into things at some point. And there's... NATO? You what? Sorry. Uh, I just thought so NATO said, so functions are methods. But, yeah, kind of, sort of, yes. <laughs> methods are functions that are attached to objects. So, for example, ignore is a method because it's attached to this CN object. Main is a function because it is free floating within the whole thing. Okay, so how would we do something like this? Display products. So we could do this. We could. Uh, did we do for loops? Yes, we did. Sweet. Yes, yes. Did we do for each loops? There's no such thing. Well, there is, That's but right. we, did. we can't. We did, we did, because there was no such thing. Yes. It shows you how much of this I'm taking in. <laughs> did we do typing? <laughs> did we do semicolons? Okay, so running this program, you see that we are allowed to pass in arrays in the way that we would expect to. However, um, and we can also return arrays. So if we go ahead and say, or um, scratch that. Yeah, I've, I've I mean, just spotted something that's worrisome. Yeah. So in the, uh, yeah, I'm starting to see what the problems might be. In your definition there, you're, you're having to specify that you take in an array of four strings? Yep. Ooh. I do. That's not nice at all. No, it isn't. I don't. Now, here's the thing. Does everyone see why it's not nice? Or, or does anyone not? Because so, it just it popped out of me just then. I went, oh, yes. There might be people there. Yeah, we've got we've got a couple of no's. Do you want to clarify what the problem is there? Right. Well, the biggest problem with this code is that our function only accepts arrays with four with the length of four. So if I were to change the length to ten, uh, we wouldn't. It would still only allow us to uh, provide a, s a specific amount of number or specific. It wouldn't quite work the Ch way that we would expect it to. Essentially, is what I'm saying. Change that. <coughs> Ooh. See, it's not just a question of having a maximum of four. Does it actually have to have? 
Oh, so I'm, just, I'm being an idiot. Uh, or not. Are you having fun? Yes. Yeah, I, I just, I'm accidentally t uh, throwing in some, or accidentally causing some, uh, some things. I actually want to try something off, based off my own curiosity right now, which will hopefully explain why this is such a horrible thing. So, yeah, essentially what we've done here is, uh, well, we have caused a runtime error, but we have passed in an array that expecting... Could you change um, line 15 back to being 4 again? In this case, we just get the, uh, the uninitialized values. But yeah, see, we can't, we have to specify four. So if somebody comes along with a fifth product, what do we do? Other than have alert, an overload for every number up to the biggest integer we can have. So is everybody thoroughly confused at this point? <laughs> Nathan says, you use C sharp. And I agree. Is there a, is there a, does the solution to this get really complicated? Yes. Or is there something you could give us kind of monkey see, monkey do that works? Or are you morally opposed to that? It's, it's going to be problematic for a lot of, um, uh, let's see if we can show an example of what's going on here. Yes, uh, so what's going on here is, is the uh, the array that we have right here is more or less, like, I guess, pointless, because as you see, it is being passed by uh, reference. And so essentially, when dealing with arrays inside of functions, we get to a lot of different, a lot of complexity um, that's going to occur. And so I just want to point out that we will need to pass around arrays um, for the homework. Um, so instead, I'm going to introduce uh, a concept of globals really quickly. We've got a few people asking about passing in without the number. You can do this, and this will essentially, it's, it's going to behave the exact same way. The number is more or less kind of just there for whatever purposes. It, it's not going to be... Yeah. But here's the, first, the problem. Sorry, the though. first thing I asked you was, do you have to put the number there? And you said yes. No, you, but this actually doesn't become an. This is not an array. <laughs> that's why. That's why oh, these gets really get complicated. This is actually an integer pointer. Yeah, I can see how this could get very, it's gone already out of the scope of yeah. these classes. <laughs> so I didn't want to uh, to get into this, and instead of instead of getting into pointers right now, uh, what we could do is... Um, Include lists. <laughs> and just say, let's not use arrays anymore. They're not called lists. Well, what we could, what we could talk about really quickly are the concept of globals. So okay. it doesn't pass a copy, but passes a reference to the original array. Essentially, it does. But in order to successfully do the homework, you're going to have to have some sort of global, global thing, unless you want to deal with the complexities of passing arrays around in functions, which we don't have. Don't. Yeah. How can one mute Nelson? Uh. Okay, so... Globals are not a good thing that we want to use very often, but they are going to be required for um, well, this situation at least. For this particular situation. Did we talk? We talked about constants, right? I'm pretty sure we did. I believe so. I wouldn't swear to anything anymore. Lots of yeses. Yes. 
Okay, so here's how we would properly separate out these two functions into their own things. What we are doing is introducing globals, which are not a particularly good um, uh, which are not a particularly good uh, thing to do with programming, and in fact they are quite poisonous. But the simple fact is, is in order to not... How, what, why and how, what do you mean by poisonous? Poisonous in that we are defining um, global state inside of our program that can be mutated by any function that, that wants to mutate that global state. And we are no longer... Or we open up a situation where functions are now allowed to do things with our global state in a way that other functions might not be compatible with. And once you start to get into programs of significant size, then you run into situations where it's very difficult to reason about how the state of your program is being altered. And when I say the word mutate, I mean change. Because these globals are mutable by every single function in our program. And while that might sound like a great idea at first, and it might be an appropriate solution for a program of this length but no more, because we only have two functions, but it should be avoided as much as possible simply because uh, by allowing other functions to mutate our state in a way that isn't controlled, we really restrict how we can reason about our code. But again, it's important to it's important to realize that the reason we're doing this here is simply out of necessity because we don't want to get into pointers just yet. And yeah, so by globals, do you just mean anything outside of main, uh, or rather anything outside of any class? Well, any any function basically. You mean any function? Yeah. So, does anybody have any questions about global? And they're pretty much. Um, I do what it says in the tin. They're global. They're globally accessible. I personally, it's a little easier to kind of visualize it in C sharp, I find, because you don't have this idea of free floating functions. So there, there's, you know, they're naturally a lot more limited in their occurrences, or should be. Would you agree with that, or is that? Sorry, I was... Are you even listening? Yeah, I was looking at Buzznet. Um, what was that? I know I'm a terrible person. I, I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Um, quick rewind the video. Okay, so let's go ahead and quickly talk about function prototyping. Um, function prototyping is going to be the concept of forward declaring a, um, a function so that we can use it without having a definition being immediately available. Wow. I understood all of those words, but again, the order they were in foxed me slightly. So basically, we want to be able to have main be at the topmost of our program for now. Now, there is a very valid reason to use function protocol or fun function uh, prototypes, but we're not going to get into header and CPP files just yet. So let's talk about really quickly about function prototypes and how we can use them without using a without separating our files. But what I'm about to show you is necessary for separating out files. So let's start with defining these functions where I want them to be. I want these functions to be defined underneath main. But here's the problem. When I try to build, I get get product names, identifier not found, which is, again, really frustrating error because IntelliSense says, ooh, get product names. It's a void function that return, or accepts nothing. I'm just going to tell you that it's valid right here and not give you an error. But the compiler says, no, wait a sec, I don't know what that is. And then you're like, well, is IntelliSense broken? Is the compiler broken? Am I broken? Um, you know, what's are my name? Where am I? Sort of are thing. there compilers that uh, as, as sort of out of the box, as it were, don't um, 
throw you know that 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 do handle things like this gracefully. Well, see, here's here's the the graceful situation would be that the compiler would say, oh, I can't find this identifier. Did you mean this function? That's this one here. Yeah, that would be a, a, yeah. a better error message. But the fact is, the C++ specification um, mandates that everything is forward declared or defined before it's used. So how do we do that? Well, with function prototypes. So these are just they're essentially anonymous method calls. Well, they're they're just uh, not they're anonymous. just they're like um. Uh, like interf interface definitions in C sharp. Uh, kind of. They're saying that that the this function with this signature exists somewhere, but we don't know what it is yet. And the compiler is like, oh, derpy derp. Okay, you said that this thing exists, and I'm going to believe you, and I'm going to continue to compile the code. Um, and then the linker goes in afterwards and says, oh, compiler, you asked for this bit of code. Well, I now know that it's right here, so I'm going to link it up for you. Dun, 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 dun. So what is the linker? I was actually it sounds like a, like a cable TV daytime. I really like wanted to uh, get over prototypes and header and C++ files and namespaces before talking about um, the linker. Okay. Uh, just so because the linker is looming, but it not is imminent. Because uh, the linker is, I'm going to include a discussion about stack frames, uh, local variable scope, and the linker all at one. But I want to leave that till the end, uh, so that people okay. can get the most out of these simpler concepts before getting uh, brain dead. Just so you know, the linker is now totally dressed like Batman in my head. <laughs> Continue. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so what we have is we have a prototype. What happens if we declare a prototype and don't actually de define the method? Well, the compiler, which we've already established is not very intelligent, is going to go, okay, I can do that. See, it compiles, but then the linker steps in and says, hey, where is that function? I don't know where it is. So the compiler was like, hey, this is totally cool. Uh, you said this is there, I believe you. And then it gets betrayed when the linker gets involved. You um, betrayed it. I betrayed the compiler. I've You're lied. so emotionally attached to your compiler. So um, this is very important. And somebody asks, does the signature of the prototype have to be the same as a function? As the function, yes, it really does. And that's how we can support op, uh, overloading within prototypes. So for example, I can say int div int uh, rh or lhs int rhs. Then I can say double div double lhs double rhs. And I can use both these overloads. Again, the compiler is totally cool with me right now. I have lulled the compiler into a false sense of security by making a promise that I didn't keep. Um, but if I wanted to fulfill that promise, all I would have to do is actually to give the, both of these functions a, uh, a, a body. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Can you just scroll up a little bit? So I was going to ask him, and I can't for the life of me remember what it was now. Something on screen now made me think. So yes, how does this help us with the with the issue of not knowing how big our array is? No, oh, it doesn't. Oh. <laughs> it, it doesn't. Uh, again, we, we're using globals for arrays. Uh, because that's going to be the only appropriate way to deal with this situation at the moment. Well, you got me all excited then. I misunderstood. Uh, because we can, we can. If you, if people really want to use arrays in their function um, parameter list, then go for it. It's just if it doesn't, if your program crashes, doesn't work, or uh, blue screens Gavin's computer when he runs it for homework, uh, then you won't pass the homework. There will be retribution. Uh, does the order of the function still matter for function prototyping? It does not. I can de de declare these functions anywhere. And in addition, notice how div and div, 
they both have prototypes here in line 10 and 11. So that means inside of get product names, I can use div and div. I can say div one, two. But do the, do the, the actual order of the, 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 the declaration at the top happen in matter? No. If they were interrelated? Nope. In the bodies. So notice how uh, get product names invokes div, even though div is prototyped after get pro product names. That's cool. Okay. Uh, da, da, da. Do the parameter identifiers have to be the same? No, they do not. In addition, they don't even have to exist. Uh, the parameters are irrelevant and they can be omitted in prototypes only. The parameter names? Parameter names, yes. You don't have to give parameter names in your prototypes. Do you ever use this? I will always uh, provide parameter names in my prototypes. And the reasoning is, is for prototypes, depending on the way you have things set up, will pop up for IntelliSense. And having parameter names really gives you a very good idea about how that function works and how to use it. Parameter names are one of those things that you really have to pay attention to when naming your things, otherwise your code won't make quite much sense. Yes, particularly if they're all called item, or like a certain construct I could mention. Stop reading BuzzNet and typing about ponies. Okay, I'm just waiting on questions here. Um, any more questions about prototyping? Uh, in general terms, C++ is very dependent on global declaration. Should we think like this? No. Once we start talking about namespaces, object-oriented programming, and the correct way to pass arrays around your program, then it'll become very unnecessary to ever create global variables or global functions that are not attached into a namespace or a class. That being said, because those concepts are something that's going to have to require discussion, and because there is so much to discuss before we get to that discussion, um, for the moment, we're just going to take some of these things for granted. But in the future, the program, your program should not be structured like this. It's just... Think of this as a trip back in time in terms of programming. Yeah. Um, this isn't the way we do things in the 21st century. No, no. I never did get my Buck Rogers jumpsuit. Anyway. Okay, any more questions any about more questions? prototyping? Because we are about to get into header and CPP files and namespaces. Actually, no, we're going to do header and CPP files first. Mr. Complicate, was that a yes you don't understand or yes, oh, you want headers? Okay. Uh, Chris, what, basically any, uh, there's any number of subjects where that essentially is what you do. Uh, because generally speaking, most things have got more complex over time. And particularly with something like programming, where much of the sort of syntactic complexity is to enable you to do long involve things more rapidly. Um, yes. uh, is there any specific place that you normally put prototypes, like in a class? Good question. Um, you generally will prototype out classes, and you generally put prototypes in header files. So let's talk about multiple files really quickly here. Multiple files? Yep. Now, what did you just do? I went to source files, I right-clicked, hit add, went to new item, selected CPP file, gave it a name, and hit add. Just so you know, at that speed, still didn't see all the windows. But there's only one. Okay, right-click source files. Just, no, just, just add. Because you are starting to get quicker and quicker again. New item, CPP file. Give it a name and hit add. Okay. So now what we have is we have two source files. We have a main.cpp and math.cpp. 
Now, source files are truly the only thing that the C++ compiler cares about. The C++ compiler only understands your code in terms of CPP files. The compiler will enumerate every file in your project, locate the CPP files, and compile them. Every other file will be more or less ignored. So does that mean that when people are submitting homework, they could, in theory, just submit the CPP file? Not necessarily, because you could have header files that are included by CPP files. Ah. But first, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is quickly, what happens if we take our div code and we stick it over here? Any guesses to what happens uh, with this code? You see, I'm surprised. I, I, I imagine that would only have one thing in it. What would it being a math file? What do you mean, like a static class called math? Well, you know, there's, there's more than one maths in that. <sighs> okay, people, there are a lot of errors. A lot of errors. Well, surprisingly, if I hit F5, it works. And it's not actually all that surprising. The reason it's not all that surprising is because we have our prototypes right here. Because we have the prototypes right here inside of main.cpp, these functions can be defined in any other CPP file. Ooh. So what if you've got a math2.cpp that's also got div functions in it? At that point, the uh, so if I have a, or you mean the same functions? In functions it can't distinguish. I'm get, what I'm getting at is um, right. scoping issues. So if we have a math2 file, oh, come on. I don't know what its rules are for not allowing me to do horizontal splits, but they really ignore, annoy me. So if I had a math2 CPP file, and I do this, and I hit control shift build we get linker errors. Because although the compilation happens linearly, the linker is aware of everything that happened. And it knows that these two functions defined in different files override each other. He's watching over us, protecting us. Yes. He's making up for the uh, compiler's inadequacy in regards to intelligence. Okay, so um, so okay, so getting out of math too. Um, does any everybody sort of at least have the understanding of what's going on at, in regards to these prototypes? Like for example, let's go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and at least right now, because I have another example to show you guys that might also an addition, additionally blow your guys' mind. But are there any? Is everybody good with uh, the fact that we have defined two functions here? And we were allowed to use them by forward declaring them in our code. So it knows because of the prototypes. Yes, the C++ compiler knows that div and div are valid functions because we've given them prototypes. Then the, but, the C++... But that's, only be, what? that's only because you've put the prototypes in main, mm -hmm. not CPP, yes? Yep. If I did not have these prototypes here, I would get errors. What I mean is, if you did have the prototypes in math.cpp. It, it would be irrelevant. Yes, you were, I saw that just as I sort of added the full stop to that sentence. Sorry. Um, how does it know when the order of the files are linked? It's irrelevant as far as the, the order. If the code is split between files, will it just search for any additional files in the same folder? Um, the When Visual C++ compiles our project, when I hit Control shift b or F5, it's going to tell the C++ compiler about all the CPP files that we have in our project. 
So it's it's going to make it aware of of these for us on our behalf. So you might want to nuke that math too before it bites you. Well, I, I already got rid of it. Oh, did you nuke the code? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. I just saw it there in the solution explorer. And went, oh, well, that's going to come back later, and you not know what's going on. Okay. Um, what actually happening behind the scenes when the compiler encounters the prototypes? We're going to be talking about that when I bust out the whiteboard to go over stack frames and the linker. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry that might not be a satisfactory answer, but I'm aware that some people here are not going to find that discussion very interesting, whereas other people are. So that's going to be today, though. That is going to be today. later today. But I want to get over um, header files and namespaces first. So the prototypes must be specified uh, in the main file? No. They must be specified before use. So, uh, and I'll get more, more into that with my next example. Can you include math.cpp and not prototype them? You can, but I'm gonna sh I'll show you an example after the example I already have queued to show you why that's not a good idea. Show us... Where, Your example now. Where does it say that math and main.cpp are related? It does not. Math and CPP are not related. The only way that they're related is they happen to both be files that are sent into the same compilation session. They are not related in any concrete way as far as the text inside of them. The thing that relates the two files isn't anything about the files themselves, but about the fact that we d prototype our div function and then we define it in a separate file. So the proto, sorry, I don't know why I raised my hand. Okay, me neither. Okay, so let's go ahead and bring up a third example that's really going to make people sad for C++. Oh, right. I'm going to add a source file called products. Inside products, I'm going to stick get product names and display products. Makes sense. But wait a sec, I have some problems. You'll notice main is totally done with this. Main doesn't care. Main's fine. You forward declared everything. The compiler's happy. Um, and, and I'm also going to bring over my includes over here because the includes are only are only required at a, uh, at a CPP file level. So by I need to include my files here to get access to sin and sout. CN Just like you're using yeah. in, in um, C sharp, but so obviously, well, presumably, um, moving the div uh, declarations from nine to ten and eleven would cause problems in main. So, do you have to copy them across? Well, yep, I have to forward declare these div functions. That's it. That gets rid of the error on line ten because I've I've copied over the forward declarations. But I'm still getting errors with product counts and product names. So, hello, hello. Um, yeah. Did you say you'd copied them over? No, I didn't copy over product count or product names. Uh, no, the div one. I did. Div. I did copy over. Oh, the div now ones. there they are. Yep. They literally just appeared <laughs> on my screen. I think my bandwidth might be having problems. Okay, carry on. Um, if I disappear, you'll know why. Alrighty. Okay, so now I forward declare div and div, which means I can now invoke the div functions. But now I'm going to have to bring over my product names and product counts for this code to work. And now when I hit Control shift b and then hit F5, you'll notice my code works again, which is awesome. So, does anybody have any questions? Is anybody thoroughly confused? Well, essentially, you had to bring... Well, in, in the product uh, CPP file, at line 13, in get product names, you need to use div. Mm -hmm. So you had to bring div across. Yep. And then inside of div... Um, oh, sorry. And then following that, you get to product count. So you need your product count, 
And then following that, you need product names as well. Yep. Inside of get product names. And over in main, you need the, uh, the references to get product names and display products. And div. And div. Well, we're using div inside of main, yeah. lines 12 and 13. Div is defined in math.cpp. Why are the globals being moved? The globals are being moved so that products.cpp is aware of them. I think when you move them, you put them underneath your divs, and when they were in main, they were above them. Ah, well. Okay. So let's talk really quickly about extern. Would changing product count value in one file create problems for the other file? No. Is the reason for all these different... He's, you are? I was just going to point out, the, 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 he, he copied and pasted the div... Um, forward declarations, but he moved product count and product name. Yep, and that's very he important. It's a very important distinction that we're going to be getting into really shortly here. No, don't be don't be sorry. It's just uh, if you hadn't asked, I wouldn't have thought to point it out. Is the reason for all these different CPP files for readability? Yes, it's about readability and um, and maintainability of the project. It's a very important concept, and it allows us to, to have a discussion about the linker. Um, okay, so yes, functions can be prototyped multiple times when you need them. So let's talk about this right here. Uh, so the compiler will loop over 10,000 files to find function definitions. No. The compiler doesn't find the definitions of a function. The compiler, for example, right here on line 13, the compiler doesn't actually generate an opcode that will invoke the div function. It says... An opcode? Uh, a machine instruction, a CPU instruction. Um, what it's going to say is, okay, I know that there exists a div function because you have promised me that there is one. But I don't know where it is. I don't know how to invoke it. So it's going to be, it's going to stay in that transient state until it gets to the linker. The linker is then going to say, okay, well, you need a div function right here. We don't know where it is yet. Let me go find it for you. Oh, here it is. Uh, now insert this instruction here to invoke this specific method or function, sorry. So if you'd put, so the linker will loop over. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. That, the answer would have been yes. But remember, the linker is working with what are called object files, not source files. The linker is working with the output of the compiler, so it doesn't need to do any parsing. Okay, so let's go ahead and do something that will blow everybody's mind. I want to be inside of main. I want to say for var i we are going to be whiteboarding once we start talking about the linker again. I know I keep on like actually answering specific questions about the linker and then saying I'm going to wait. So I'm I'm sorry for the small amount of, uh, well, laws. Uh, for var, sorry, wasn't thinking. Uh, I smaller than product count I plus <laughs> plus. I really wanted that to work. Me too. Okay, so I want inside of main for me to loop over our product names array. But guess what? We can't. It's undeclared. You really want all that red to go away. Yeah, I don't like the red squigglies. So how do no, we do messy. it? Well, the first, the first thing that people might try to do is take this, cut it, and paste it over here. Which makes main work but it breaks our products.cpp file, as you see on the, on the right. The next thing you might want to try to do is copy and paste product count and product name so that they exist in both the files. But now when Ooh, I go no. ahead and build, we get a linker error. Now, the product count, I want to point out, is a constant, and it has no correlation to anything at runtime. So we can redeclare this const int in any file that we want. 
but the problem is, is product names. As you see right here, linker, product names, already defined in main.obj. We've essentially done what we did when we copied the functions between files. When we had math and math2, where we had two de definitions of the, uh, the add function inside of our code, and we would get an error. What we're trying to do is we're trying to access the product names global from within the main function and within these get product names functions. So what do we do? Not the CPP file. Uh, extern. Extern. Extern is basically like a function prototype. We are getting into headers. Headers is where we're going, but I, you need to understand that headers are not required. Headers are a feature, or not even a feature, they're just a thing that we do to make life easier. It doesn't have any actual real correlation to the uh, compilation process whatsoever. And we'll be talking about them later. Yes, after we get extern into everybody's head. Go on. What extern does is it's a prototype for a global variable. External, yeah. for any of you who couldn't work out the, the two other letters. So basically, we're just making a prototype of our, of our variable. We're saying there exists somewhere a product names variable, and we want to use it, but we don't know where it is. Then products.cpp defines it right here. Now, what happens if I specify both these as extern? Well, I'm going to get a nice little linker error just like with function prototypes. Because I've declared both of these variables as external, and there's no definition of either of these, we get an error. And do you, and you split, you've used it, but is it, is it mandatory to have product count in the extern definition? And or the no, one? Uh, no, they could, they could just both be the, like one could be the constant for and the other one could be product count. But they, could, could they be empty? No, they couldn't be empty, and it couldn't be like like six, for example, because at this, or okay, so that the extern definition can be empty, but the uh, the product names, well, see, this actually has a different meaning right here, um, and we do get a nice little linker error, but the different meaning right here has to do with the difference between the uh, the pointers. Somebody don't, said, don't you have to extend the constant as well? No. You do not have to extend the constant. I was going to ask about this. What if one of them had a different number? Would it just be purely random which one it got to first? Or rather, not random, but would it be down to which one it got to last as to what value was used? No, it has to do with which one's defined in which, uh, in which function. So, for example, notice how... Notice how I got asked for six products, mm -hmm. but main only printed out four? That's because the product count constant in main was set to four, but the product count constant in products was set to six. They are fundamentally huh. different constants. They have no correlation oh, okay. to each other. Yeah, that makes, that makes more sense. So if I think of them as like main.productCount equals four, but products.productCount equals six. Conceptually. Yes? Yeah. No? Should we always extern elements in main.cpp? No. You should do this in header files. And that's about, that's actually right where we're going just as long as nobody has any more questions about extern. Um, so basically, extern is the prototype. The product names in product.cpp is the implementation of the prototype. Yes. That is essentially what's going on right now. And if I take out product names from products.cpp, we get a linker error. Well, actually, we get a compiler error first because product names is no longer defined in products.cpp. But if we turn this into an extern product names, the compiler errors would go away, but the linker errors would not because now there's no product names variable actually being defined anywhere in my code. So 
So product count is not that global, only in the file itself. Yes, product count is just within the file. Always think about C++ programs as CPP files and nothing else. And each CPP file is simply a, a very distinct, unique uh, entity that is only associated with other CPP files through the use of function prototypes and external variables. Uh, is it possible preferred to external consts? No. Um, there's no way to define a constant as external because external is all about the compiler. Well, it's going to let us do that, but it's not going to have much meaning because the, the constant is all about going to be the compiler, um, not the linker. External is about the... And there's a few questions which are all variations on a theme, which is, um, does it matter which one's declared as external and which one isn't, if only, as long as only one is? So could, could the product swap version be declared as external instead of the main one? Oh, yeah. If I just swapped it, that would yeah. still work. Okay. If product name is uh, if product name in product.cpp is the implementation, does that mean string product name six in both product CPP and main CPP now, even when product count is different? Yeah, in this case, uh, product names is technically an array. Um, well, here's a way to blow your guys' mind. I'm fairly confident that this will do what I want it to. However, we reserve the right for it not to. <laughs> yep. Okay, so I'm going to say, I'm going to see out uh, count of names in main. And then inside of get product names, I'm going to say count of names in products. Okay, does everybody see what I did there? Inside of main, I'm going to print out how many elements the compiler thinks is in product names. And then inside of products.cpp, when you invoke the get product names function, I'm going to print out the amount of elements that products thinks is inside of product names. So when I run this, you'll notice that the compiler thinks that the amount of names that you have in main are four, whereas in main, whereas in products, it thinks that the amount of names that you have is six. That being said, the actual count of the amount of items and products is actually six. Because that's how much memory was allocated for our string. It is confusing in this case because product count and product count are different. Yep. You could actually change the name. Can you, have you got refactoring shortcuts? No. Could you change the names of one of those? Well, I, yeah, I can call this product count two and product count two and product count two and product count two. So in, instantly then it becomes clear what's going on, I think. They are completely separate. And like Flash is saying, messy and, and better. Yeah, this again comes down to, to naming of parts. Uh, Muhammad, sorry about that. I, the questions panel is actually getting flooded right now. <laughs> Um, Which question? With whom can we use extern? Uh, you can use extern with uh, the only place that... What, what am I doing? Breaking things. The only place that I would... It, without getting into... Actually, I don't really want to get into that right now because the other situations that you might use extern would, might have to do with using DLLs and other libraries. And I don't want to get into that too much right now. What I really just wanted, for right now, just think about extern as a keyword that you can use to forward declare a variable. 
So the two product names have different memory addresses. No. These two product names have the same memory address because this one is defined as a forward declaration of our variable. This is declared defined as the implementation of our variable. And they both point to the same bit of memory. Is it just, um, is, is it? No, actually, that's not going to help. I'm not even going to ask that because I'll confuse more people than it will help. Oh, they, uh, uh, he meant a product count. No, product count doesn't have a place in memory. Product count is a constant, which means conceptually the compiler takes and copies and pastes the value of product count into wherever it appears. So it has no actual memory location. <clears throat> that's why that's why we can declare them twice and the and the linker doesn't throw a fit because it's not actually something that's that's that matters at runtime it's all handled by the compiler so they don't have any memory address okay so i'm going to go ahead and step outside and pause the video and any more questions that come in? So resume. Are you recording again? We are resuming. We have been resumed. Okay. So if product names in both CPP files have the same memory address, does it mean that it allocates six slots total for both CPP files, and use four of those slots in main, or does it allocate four for main and then deallocate it before allocating six? Um, the answer to that question is that this is going to always allocate the memory required for the definition of the variable, not the forward declaration. In fact, specifying a forward declaration amount isn't actually required, as you can see right here. It still allocates the same amount of memory, because this is the definition of the variable. This is simply a forward declaration of the variable. It's quite puzzling that product count doesn't have a memory address because you said that at the beginning of the series that when you say int x, the compiler allocates part of the memory to store the information. Could you please clarify? Yes, this is a constant. Because I added the const modifier, it does not allocate a memory. It does not allocate memory for anything. If this was not a constant we would get a nice little, well, first of all, we would get a compiler error because we can't set a, uh, a, a an array to being a non-constant size. But in addition, we would also get a linker error because now we are defining two of the same variables inside of both the CPP files. Does that answer your question? Sorry, Sorry what? You confuse me now. Yeah, if how does how does them not being const mean they're suddenly not in different? Because now that they're not const, if I were to fix the compiler error, yeah, I would get a linker error because there's multiple int product counts defined. If I added an extern qualifier to product count. Now we would get the same behavior that we did with product names, where we forward declared this variable, then defined it in this file. See, I, aside from I think that's a much nicer way of doing things but you than the other way. You can't use seems to me. a non-constant as a amount of items to allocate for an array. Just, Just the, the external and declaring it over there. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how we can fix this once we get into headers, which we, which we are right about now. Okay, so everybody can agree that this, what we have right here is very gross and nasty. Basically, we forward declared so many things. Why is he eating dust? Anyway, we forward declared so many things, um, and we will have to repeatedly forward declare things if we want to use them in our CPP files. So what we can do is we can group our forward declarations into a header file that's going to be shared by multiple CPP files. Let's go ahead and see what that looks like. 
It looks a lot like a C-sharp interface definition. Declaring. I'm going to declare a math header file, and I'm going to declare a products header file. It looks a bit like that. So now we have two header files, math and products. Let's go ahead and move our forward declarations out of main, math, and products and into these header files. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and move uh, in main, I'm going to go ahead and move this stuff into products.h. Now we notice something. And does the name of you what? does the name of the header matter? Other no. than obviously when you're calling it, no. you just happen to use products again. I'm going to use products again because it corresponds to the CDN. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't know if it, it was a. It had to. Okay, so you notice that right off the bat we get an error because I need to inside the header file include string and say using namespace. Actually, I'm just going to use using std string. Actually, I'm just going to say extern std string to keep things simple. Then I'm going to take all of the display products and the get product names and I'm going to stick them in the header file as well. Now I can remove all of this stuff inside of main.cpp and instead of forward declaring them in main.cpp I can now say include products.h. Oh, isn't that and nice? And that's in quotations, not in uh, uh, angle brackets. Right, because uh, that's not going to be valid because the angle brackets are used for finding uh, other headers. So, so would, just, sorry, just to be utterly clear on that, because you replace them with angle brackets, would products in angle brackets without the dot h also not be the same? Yeah, products in angle Stop. brackets wouldn't be the same as products in quotations. As you see, I'll get an error saying that it can't find... No, products, not product dot h. Products dot h? Oh dear god. Products in angle brackets without a dot h. Oh, so like this. This will still be invalid because string actually is the name of the file. It just doesn't have a .h file or a .h extension. Okay. Okay. I hope it's... Is, people might be confused as to what I just did. That being said, I really want to point out that introducing header files in any way other than how I just did it would have been more confusing. And just trust me on that. Because that's how I was introduced to header files. I was just like, oh, you can do the header files. So then I was like, oh, what's a header file? I'm like, oh, you just put your prototypes. And I was like, well, why do you need a prototype? And then at that, end, at that point, I don't get an answer and I get confused. So I really want to point out here that this introducing it this way is still really important. What this is doing on line three is this is taking the contents of products.h, copying it, and pasting it. There is absolutely 100% no difference at all. And I think you just answered my question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, do we actually still need include string in um, whatever the left-hand CPP file is called? Um, or the, the right-hand side? The, oh, do we just... No, the left -hand. No, we don't need it, but we still should have it there. What? Yes. Think of think of uh, think of uh, the concept of um, and in fact we don't even need it over here. We'll get an IntelliSense error, but we won't get a compiler error because of how products.h is being used. However, if I defined if I included a string after products.h and I did not include a, this string in products.h, now I would get a compiler error at some point. Yeah. <laughs> this, this all, I love the way that it both makes sense and is completely idiotic. I can see why, but the fact that they let you do that is just silly. Anyway. So, yeah, and I would still do it up here just because, let's say somebody who didn't include a string that didn't need a string for other purposes required or wanted to add in products.h we would need to do it here as well. So this is about separation of responsibility. 
But why do you... I'm sorry, I'm unclear as to why you're including it in the main, though, because... Actually, I don't know. When you pasted, when you pasted that into main, you, were, you ended up with two include strings in a row. Yes, which is irrelevant because of what are called include guards, which we're going to be talking about. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that, that surely that's indicative of the fact that you don't need it in main. Oh, uh, actually, I don't think we do need a main cause just because we're not using any strings in main. But if we were using strings in main, um, then we, we would. No. Actually, no, because it's, being, it's in, being included by products.h. It's, it's a matter of readability. It's a matter of readability and separation of concerns. Think of products.h like an abstraction. We don't care what it uses internally at a conceptual basis. We, but we include string right here because we want to be able to use product names properly. It's like, mm. like Segfault says, it's important to keep string independent from products.h. Because they're, they're... But we're only using it in products.h. We are implicitly using it in main right here because of the product names. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just, just if having it twice, twice seems, seems wrong. wrong. It, but it's right. <laughs> Makes me feel dirty. You know what I mean? It's that sort of, it just doesn't feel... Okay. okay. When we include string twice, is the program slower because string is pasted twice? It is not because of what are called include guards. And we're going to be talking about include guards very shortly. Okay, so now that I have product.h defined here, it's also very important to also include your product.h inside the product.cpp file. So now I can say include product.h. Now this isn't required, but it's typically what you would do because for example, now but that now that I've said include products.h, I can get rid of line 7. The reason I can get rid of line 7 is now the constant is being defined in a single place. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Somebody did ask, and it was a question I was meant to ask earlier, but are uh, angle brackets for built-in libraries and .h in quotes for user-defined, or is it not that straightforward? It's, it, you can think of it like that. The, dot a, the, the, okay. the quotes are for files that can be located within the project, and then the angle brackets are used for external libraries. Okay. So now that we've included products.h twice, uh, or now that we've included products.h, we do not need to include the product count const. And notice that we still need to include this. Can anybody guess why we still need to include this? Can anybody guess why it's important that we still have line 7, even though we were able to get rid of the const? The reason is, is this is the implementation of string names. This is the forward declaration of string names. If I took this out, I would get a linker error or a variety of linker errors because now we're no longer implementing this contract. But if you, um, could you not, um, what if you uh, removed that external, you got higher, yeah. Now we get another linker um, error. And made it. We get another linker error because now this is being declared twice. Remember, this. So okay, following through on that. What, so okay, what happens if you get rid of the one in uh, products.cpp? You can't because the header file is only a, a list of things, headers, really. I, I don't follow. Well, following through, we got rid of the extern. And then we got a, a, an error because right. it was being declared twice. So get rid of the other declaration. Then we'll get a linker error. Get rid of it. No, you've still got extern in there. Oh, we'll still get a linker error. We'll get a linker error because now there still are two product names. Remember that the preprocessor literally copies and pastes this. So because it'll literally copy and paste this code into line three of products.cpp and main.cpp, we will get two definitions of the same variable with the same name. Yeah. yeah. 
so that's why this is the only way, this is the only valid way of doing it. And as Lee Amanator put it quite succinctly, the header file only makes the items available to use. Right. It doesn't implement them. Okay, so now let's give the same treatment to math. It's going to be very similar. I'm going to right click, or oh, we already have my math header. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take it over here. I'm going to take our prototypes and I'm going to dump them into math.h. And I'm going to do the same thing on main. I'm going to take these prototypes and just erase them. Everybody following? Mm -hmm. And then now all I have to do is say include math.h. And then in math .c or main.cpp, I can say include math.h. Now, I want to stress this. This code will compile and work awesome. However, as a matter of convention, the corresponding CPP file for an .h file, and wow, I just closed it for no reason. The corresponding CPP file should always include the header file as a matter of convention, even if it doesn't need it. That's because you typically will end up needing it in the first place. Like if we wanted to declare a math constant and we wanted to use it in here, we would have to use it anyway. So as a matter of convention, this is generally preferred. Are include guards the same as import and does C++ support import? Um, C++ supports import, but it's not, I don't think it's the same thing as Objective-C. I'm not familiar enough with Objective-C to suggest it, but it's not, a, it, it has to do with static libraries and not um, header files. Okay. So is everybody kind of getting what's going on so far? Because there's one big problem with our header files right now. Does anybody have any more questions? Because there are a lot of a lot of new concepts that were introduced and a lot of interesting things, but hopefully I introduced them in the in the order that makes them make more sense. But yeah, the, what, it, that seemed the log it all followed on logically one thing to another. What's the big problem? Is the only question I can come up with. The big problem isn't apparent with the way we have set up this code. And may not be apparent, um, it may not necessarily be that apparent. I, I could come up with some examples, but I do actually have an example right now off the top of my head. Let's jump back into the uh, how includes work. So when I include products.h, the C++ preprocessor, uh, somebody asked, why did products.cpp need math.h? Uh, because it line uses 12. line 12, it divides. Even though it doesn't do anything with the result, I just threw that in there so that it was forced to include math.h. Okay, the preprocessor will copy and paste our code. So if I copy and paste this code in here, now this has already been touched on already. But here's the problem. And I can go ahead and do the same with math, just to, just to be consistent here. Here's the problem. String is included twice. The reason but you said that wasn't a problem. it isn't a problem, but it's because string is set up in a way that our header files are not set up. String is correctly written like what Segfault said. It uses what are called um, include guards. So let's go ahead and talk about, so you see a situation where a header gets included twice. What happens if I include products.h twice? Which this, this scenario happens frequently. There's the examples that I can come up with right now might be slightly contrived, but this situation does happen frequently. In bigger programs. Yes. Um, and it's usually not directly. It's usually because you include a header file that includes a header file that includes a header file that includes the same header file that you include in your original CPP file. Well, literally like we're doing with the string there. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to be a direct thing. It could be indirect. And it happens all the time. So what happens with this code? If I hit Control shift b we'll get some nice compiler errors. It'll say product count redefinition. Product names redefinition. 
this is problematic. We need a way to make sure that product.h is only included once. In Visual C++, there are two ways to do this. We can say pragma once at the top of our header file. Paragma once will allow, will make it so that the include only happens once. But, but do you, it's, presumably that's only for that header file? If we're only for this header file, yes. But the problem with Paragma once is that it's uh, Visual C++ specific. So the correct way to do this is through include guards. Stop showing off so cool. Or oh, what am I doing? String, really? Seems, seems so. This does the same thing. What this is doing is saying if not defined the constant or not the, the, the defined products, then define products. And then I wrap the entire header around this if statement. This preprocessor if statement will only allow us to go through this header once per CPP file. Would um, uh, would it be acceptable um, layout to have the if end if and define lines on the same? Uh, it's line? not possible to do that. Oh right. Preprocessor directives must be prefixed with a pound. Oh, and no, yeah, no semicolons. Yep. Could we call products to be anything thing, else? Yeah. You can, but I would recommend either what I have here or what I have here. You want the, the define to correspond to the product name by, um, or to the header name. So, for example, if I right-click on string.h, you'll notice it has both the pragma once. Because this implementation of the standard library is specifically Visual C++ specific, Every compiler has a different alt implementation for the standard headers, or for the standard library. Well, that, that one's kind of belt and braces, isn't it? You break, what? Well, you've got the if not defines as well. Yes, it does both. It has the pragma once and the if not defines, presumably because of older versions of Visual C++. So because of the pragma once, in this case, because we are using Visual C++, but more specifically because of these include guards, that's why it's valid for us to include string as many times as we want, and it only happens once. So can you now do set that up? Can you now use the uh, the angle bracket? Now that you've got proper thingamajigs, can you use the angle brackets for products? No. Now? It's still not going to know where to find it. Grr. So let's go ahead and give math the same treatment. If n def, or if not defined, math h, define math h, and if. Every header file that you ever write should have these. Which makes perfect sense. It's no different than you would um, wrap uh, any other, like a, 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 a um, you know, if list dot contains, if not list dot contains, Right. Blah, add, list dot add, blah. You would wrap that if as well to make sure that you're not adding the same thing twice. Yep. Uh, does the name math dot h, math h matter? Um, this is one convention that, that I like, and you should always have the name of the header file inside of your include guard. This is a rule that you should always follow and will result in failed homework if you don't. Sorry, what is? Uh, using the naming convention. convention. No, using include guards. And your include guards must include the name. Okay. I would sometimes get problems if I added comment after end if. Comment after end if. I, if you added comments after his end if in the header. I, I, I've never done that. I mean, some people like doing this. But uh, typically this is implied 
because it is at the end of a header file and this is a convention you should always 100% follow. So I wouldn't add any comments after end ifs. In this case, for include guards. For other purposes you might. It's really just a throwaway signifier for you. Uh, uh, in reading the code. Sorry, the question was why is the, if not defined name not case sensitive? What? And really, if you look at how it's being used. I mean, it is case sensitive. No, the net. This, oh, I wish you'd listen. Why is <laughs> if end if name not case sensitive? I, math underscore h in this case. It should be. Unless I'm really mistaken. Why? No. Why? Or am I? You. You just. You. Why is it? It could be giraffe dot hippopotamus. Oh, why is it all in caps? Oh, because that's a convention of defines. But it really doesn't have to be, does it? No. That would work too. The point being is it's, it's literally just a throwaway signifier. Um, but used then and there and thrown away afterwards. Yeah. Essentially flash. Okay, so any questions about headers? Because we're about to move on to namespaces, finally. Praise, Praise the Lord. Uh, Wolf, what are your errors? What are more multiply defined symbols found? Uh, you might not have include guards, or you might be, make sure that both your headers are specific. So for example, math.h only has the two div prototypes, and products.h only has the constant, the array, that is extern, that's important, it must be extern, and then has the two methods, or two functions. And make sure you've taken the relevant code out of main uh, and end uh, products. And products. Um, could we switch over your screen real fast? And then I'll, that'll give people to ask, time to ask more questions if they have them about headers. Oh, that's the point. a bank holiday today. Or is it? No, it's Tuesday today. How does that work then? Do we have one next Monday or something? Ah, cool. Hey, we still haven't passed an array into a function. Um. Yeah, uh, go back to products.cpp real fast. Yeah, in your main.cpp, take out the line that defi or defines product names. Because string product names is no longer being defined in main.cpp, it's going to be defined in products.cpp. So if you take that out, it should build. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> oh, no, that wasn't to you. It's actually, that was to someone ringing my doorbell. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, let's take a 
30 second break and I'll be right back and then we can get on to namespaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're back. Uh, da -da. Do you need extern now that you have include guards? Yes. See, the include guards only matter in the context of a CPP file. See, I can do this as much as I want. This will only include products.h once. I can do this as much as I want. This will only include products.h once. But it's specific to the CPP file which means that product.h is actually getting included into two CPP files, but only one time each. Right, the header cannot have the implementation because products.h actually does get included twice. Once by products.cpp and once by main. So that means if I took off the extern keyword, because products.h got added twice into different compilation units, then um, what happens is, is the implementations conflict. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Uh, and I kind of, it's implicit in the name headers, although you, we kind of, you took it for granted because it's such a uh, common, commonly used word. Yeah. But what actually a header file is, in more general terms rather than specifically C++ terms. Yep. What a header is of anything. Okay, let's talk about namespaces. Namespaces are very simple. Um, the string header is not double anymore too. The string header still gets included twice, but the contents of the string header only get included once because of the include guards inside of string. And remember, this is per CPP file. Okay, so namespaces are very straightforward. We've already learned how to use namespaces. Let's go ahead and learn how to define namespaces. So inside of my math and products.h, I want to create a namespace that is the name of, I'm just going to do the name of my company right now, which in this case is just going to be my initials. So again, it follows a lot of the same sort of syntax that we've seen before in other constructs where we have the keyword followed by an identifier followed by what looks like a block of code. And the definitions we place inside of that block of code are going to be specific to that namespace. So, so presumably you've just broken your program. Yes. If, if you tell me no, then I'm going to just give up on C++ altogether. <laughs> but I just broke my program because our div, uh, div is no longer defined. So let's go ahead and import it into main. I'm going to say using NJL diff. And is there anyone who, because again, we're kind of rushing slightly at, at, at this, but um, does anyone not see why um, adding that namespace into the master H broke it? What we've done is we've scoped these functions into the NJL namespace. You went through the C sharp class. I think it's the exact same thing as namespacing in C sharp. Yep. Uh, NJ, uh, the, the div um, functions are no longer in the same namespace as um, the main, as the, as the rest of. Right, they're no longer uh, the in the program. global namespace. And because they're no longer in the global namespace, we have to import either by importing the specific things or by saying using namespace NJL, just like we do with STD. So um, now that I've done that, and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do the same thing in my products.cpp file because it also uses div. I'm going to get a nice little linker error. Can anybody guess why I'm getting linker errors now? Possibly, but I might well be wrong. Okay. 
The problem is, is our implementation of div is no longer in the namespace, which means this implementation doesn't correlate to these prototypes. These are two fun different functions. This is a prototype for a different function than this because I did not qualify these implementations with the namespace that I defined the prototypes under. So you've just got to, you've got to put those into NJL as well, have you? Right. So I just do namespace NJL and I can build and compile successfully. I'll be honest, I didn't notice that you haven't done that, actually. Well. <laughs> With them to the math CPU, because you did do it to the product one in the main. So let's go ahead and give products the same treatment. Now, typically, you would want to use namespaces in your program, and you'd want the namespace to correlate with the project name. Now, because my project name happens to be stuff and things with improper capitalization, I'm just simply using NJL. <laughs> so now that I've put everything in products.h in NJL, I can now do the same thing in CPP so that everything does line up. Although now what I can do is I can take out this using namespace NJL because when in the context of the NJL namespace, I don't need to, everything else from that namespace gets imported. So now when yeah, I build... It wouldn't make it, it would be, make no sense otherwise. Yeah. Okay, so is everybody good with namespaces, or at least creating your own namespaces? You'll notice when I use the namespace resolution operator, I now get all my stuff. Um, all I just did was I wrapped the prototypes of NJL or of products into the namespace NJL and I've wrapped the implementation of the of the prototypes in the namespace NJL. Is the namespace essentially a function? You see, this is... What? Sorry, this is this is this is the part of the aspect of it, of it why why it kind they kind of header files kind of feel like uh, interfaces. They've got that sort of vibe about them of because they're, they're kind of uh, they're in the same names. So it's almost like they're perhaps partial classes would be a better analogy. They just they just feel you know they're in the same namespace. They're like a bit of the same thing. They do have the feeling they don't have as much capabilities as interfaces, but no. they do. They do. They can have the same feeling because, see, an, an interface specifies something that you can implement many, many times. A header file some, is spec, or specifies something that you must implement once. Implement, implement once and only once. But other than that, I guess you could. The semantics are similar. Yeah, I'm with Mr. Complicated. He said, the problem is I'm still thinking in C-sharp, while well, I shouldn't. Um, are namespaces essentially a function? No. Namespaces are not functions. They're a way to group functionality into a container that makes sense to your program and to avoid ambiguity with other libraries and other pieces of software. <laughs> what about dotting? Uh, dotting. You can't dot. Okay. NHL.graphics. I assume that was supposed to be NJL.graphics. <laughs> Unless you turned into the National Hockey League. No, you can't dot this. The dot operator, uh, the member um, uh, member accessor operator, I can't remember the exact name to it, doesn't work. You must use the scope resolution operator. Oh, are you asking if we can do nested namespaces? So, for example, I could say inside of products, I could say I want NA NJL products. Actually, I can't remember if this syntax works or not, so if it doesn't, uh, it's not my fault. Yes, this syntax does work. Is that 
Is that not your fault either? Or does it? Oh no, never mind. This syntax doesn't work, but this syntax should. Oh, come on. This is why nested namespaces are a pain. Okay, sweet. So now we only have an error in... There we go. So now you see an example of a nested namespace. Is that something you generally avoid doing? Or? For very large projects, I would consider it. Because we use nested namespaces in C Sharp all the time. Yeah, no, that's what I was just thinking. If you're reluctant to use it, there must be something seriously uh, nasty about it. Because you're normally keen as mustard to get as many qualifiers into your namespaces. Why would I nest namespaces? Uh, again, just for really large projects where I'd want to separate out different subsystems. Uh, do you have to wrap the implementations if you're using the using namespace keyword you do? Actually, don't kill me if this doesn't work. So this is another, you know, something I've never tried, but I'm trying right now just so everybody can learn something new today. Special, Special bonus because he loves you people so much. I vaguely remember being able to do this for some reason. But, or STD, what am I doing? Yep, that works. So you can prefix your, uh, you don't have to wrap it inside of a namespace. But you must qualify every member that you want to implement with the namespace. I was going to say, that's just more writing. writing. Yeah, or wrap it in a namespace. I don't get the na nested namespaces at all. And nested namespaces work just like they do in C Sharp. Like in C Sharp, you have the the system namespace, then the system dot collections namespace, then the system collections generic namespace, and then you have the system IO namespace, you have the system dot text namespace, you have the system dot whatever namespace, and so on and so on. You look at the X and A ones, there's millions of them. Yeah. Can we visually, visually separate in our project namespaces? I can see sharp when we create multiple projects. Uh, you can if you want to. Um, generally speaking, though, this is the preferred way to handle um, these sorts of things. I do want to point out, though, that this is not Defaulters. the physical structure of the program. If I hit this button... I was gonna you what? I was going to say, our folder to folders not relate to namespace anymore. They then. don't have to, no. So if I click on show all files, you'll see that these, act these files are actually all in the same directory. Now, sometimes people will break apart into namespaces, and then underneath every namespace folder, they'll have a header files and a source files folder. But that's going to really only be appropriate for larger projects, so I don't want to go into that. Um, I've never made a nested namespace in C Sharp. Uh, making a nested namespace in C Sharp is, is just doing this. Now, of course, that's not going to work in C++, but that's what you do in C Sharp. I actually have a habit of compiling every bit of code that I type in, just because, I don't know. Um, inside of one solution. Now, I want to point this out. 
dealing with multiple projects inside the same solution in C++ is significantly more complicated and requires significantly more discussion and is significantly not something we're going to be talking about 101 than C Sharp. Oh, imagine my surprise. Static libraries and dynamic libraries are not something that's as trivial as assemblies in .NET. Okay. So is there anything else to, any more major topics to cover? Um, quickly talking about static and, and uh, anonymous namespaces, just really quickly. And a little bit about design. Now, I want to point out that putting product product names and product count inside of products.h is bad design. Okay, is everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, the number of products you've got is, is irrelevant to what the products are, are. You know, an apple doesn't care how many other apples are sat around yeah. it. And we don't want to be able so to edit presumably. product names from anybody else that doesn't own that data. That would be bad. We want to encapsulate this data inside of the concept of our products. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this out of our products.h and I'm going to go into products.cpp and actually I'm going to take off this njl prefix and just wrap it all in a namespace <laughs> because that's really bugging me. And then I'm going to paste in the constant. So I'm going to paste in our constant product count. So now I build. I will get one error in main. And the reason I get an error in main is I can no longer access this data. Because this data is now owned by the products H file and the products CPP file. So I'm going to delete this and build this. And you'll notice build was successful. Okay, everybody good with this right now? What did you need? What, how much did you nuke? Um, I got rid of in main.cpp no longer accesses products directly. Okay. So you've actually changed the functionality of the program then? A bit, yes. But now the, the, functional, the, the owning of the data is now owned by this library, this products.h file and the products.cpp file and not by main. So I've encapsulated the data. But if I wanted to be really, really, really evil, so let's let's first of all let's run this code. One, two, three, four, and we get products one, two, three, four. Um, so now let's say I was just a horrible, horrible person. I wanted to break something. Now watch this. After I get the product names, I'm going to say njl product names at one equals bleh. Now I'm going to run this function, this function, or this program. I'm going to enter in my product names, and I was I, w I was just able to reach into a private implementation detail and edit it. So do people kind of see what went on? I think that was fairly self-explanatory. Okay, generally speaking, we're going to want to pro prohibit this from being possible. There is a way to prohibit this from being possible. And that's with anonymous namespaces. So if I gave these two members a namespace without a name, namespace without a name. 
That's funny. Um, a namespace without a name. What I've just done is I've instructed the C++ compiler to only allow me to access these members within this CPP file, full stop, no exceptions. Like, like a private yes. member. So now in main.cpp, I'm getting a linker error because it's saying that, wait a sec, product, dot, product names isn't isn't actually defined anywhere. We can't access. We can't reach into the NJL namespace and yank this private mem member out, because now it's being hidden behind an unnamed namespace. Are there any non-obvious um, like implementation restrictions on when you can and can't do that? The, the only time you'd want to do this is to have private, uh, private global variables and private functions um, in the context of a CPP file. The, the limitations, I'm sure there are limitations when doing things that you wouldn't want to do with it, if you know what I mean. There's no common gotchas. No. Though. Cool. This isn't a huge, like, bre like awesome, like, feature that uh, is going to, like, shatter, like, the universe and um, solve world hunger. But it's something that I wanted to point out to people if they ever saw code like this to understand what's going on. But it will limit people's accessibility to your products. Yes, it will make it that we own this product names. Uh, I'm trying to understand how we can access the variable before using anonymous namespace. Okay, before using the anonymous namespace, we were able to, inside of main.cpp, we were able to say extern product names. We were able to say, okay, compiler, I say that there's a product names array somewhere in this program. Go ahead and let me use it, and then ask the linker to find it for me. And that's what happens. Which the linker can do. Yeah, and the because yeah, it's over there. And the linker's like, oh, hey, I see a product names array in products uh, CPP's object file. I'm going to go ahead and link this reference up to this reference because they're in the same namespace as well. Right. This is exactly how function prototypes work. Remember the fact that we have headers. is kind of, it's kind of, all these do is they just copy and paste code for us. Understanding the fact that when we forward declare something, we're not doing anything that has to, has necessarily to do with header files. All we're doing is saying that this thing exists somewhere and the linker is going to find out where exactly it exists. So we're able to sneak in and edit other things that we shouldn't necessarily be able to do. But I could do it without using an extern string. No. If you said string product names, you would first get a, or you would get a, uh, well in this case you don't, because um, that's actually a different type. Uh, the reason this, uh, I'm going to confuse everybody, this isn't an array, this is a pointer just that looks like an array because the C++ syntax decided to do that to make life confusing. But because this is now an array, a real array, it'll conflict with this real array. And when I try to do a build, I'm going to get a linker error saying that string product names is defined twice. But by adding the extern, I'm saying that product names exist somewhere. What you're saying is you could lose lines 9 to 12 all together in main. That's what he's suggesting. Oh, no. Because then I'm not forward declaring product names anywhere. I need to forward declare product names in order to access it from main. And because I'm not forward declaring it anywhere, the compiler doesn't know where it is. Now, the linker does, but the compiler isn't made aware of its existence and will throw a compiler error. That's just the comp so when's so when's Linker going to come come jumping down from the rooftops waving a batarang then, or if there's a Linker rang at the end of uh, compilation, and okay, I want to know what he does. 
Hello? Hello? It seems so legal to me. Um, because it just doesn't. That's just not how it works. Um, the compiler is responsible for knowing um, for knowing what's valid at compile time. That's just how it is. What are you watching? Uh, somebody has something upstairs. Sorry about that. I can go ahead and close my door. It sounds like you're watching. <laughs> Okay. But product names one should work, right? Why doesn't it? Well, it doesn't work because the compiler is not made aware of the existence of product names. Just because you're using namespace NJL, that, that's different to uh, the, the um, forward declaration. You're making it aware of the fact that there is an NJL namespace, but that's all. Yeah, it doesn't. You have to forward declare everything in C++. That's just how it works. The C++ compiler works linearly. It starts at line one, and it ends on line twenty-four, and that's it. If it is not made aware of things. It does not know how to reason with the things you are trying to reference. Well, here's an example. Here, I, I can now show you, show you an example. Check this out. Well, actually that's kind of a bad example. But uh, think about functions. If the C++ compiler wasn't given a forward declaration of this function, it would not know that it returned an integer. Therefore, it would not know how to tell C out what functionality to use. Therefore, it wouldn't know what overload of div to use. You see, said, but I pinpointed the variable with the NJL namespace. But that's irrelevant. I presume it on line 16. That's irrelevant. The variable doesn't exist as far as the, remember, the compiler does multiple passes. It's going to pass through this file. Only things that it knows or it, it is made aware of when compiling this file will be available to it. Nothing else. Just because you specified the NGL qualifier is irrelevant, it would be the same if I had done this. Because this namespace, this namespace doesn't even exist. But the fact is, I'm trying to ask or I'm trying to ask the compiler to reference something that it's not made aware of. It's not told what product names is. It's not told that product names is a member of NJL. It's not told anything. I, think, I imagine that's what's causing the confusion is because because you've got line seven there in main. Why why does that not make it aware of product names given that, that oh, product name I mean, yeah, I could still is in NJL namespace. But product names isn't in isn't defined. It's it's defined right here and only here. It's not a part of the header file. If it was a part of the header file, then this code would work. If I said extern string product names array, no, oh, well product names array. Oh right, derp. then this code would work because now I'm forward declaring it. Yep, main.cpp does not know anything about products.cpp, anything whatsoever. They are individual units. They have no correlation whatsoever to them. The only thing that makes them correlated is because they happen to include a header. Well, actually, the inclusion of the header file is irrelevant. The fact is, the only way, the only reason why they're correlated is because main.cpp is made aware that somewhere, somewhere, these functions are defined. Somewhere. Not necessarily in products.cpp. I could define 
uh, get product names in one CPP file and display products in another CPP file and product names array in another CPP file and they would get mashed up at the end by the linker. Okay, and again, anonymous namespaces are just ways to control accessibility. Okay, I do want to point out one more thing before we uh, maybe open up a whiteboard and talk a little bit about the linker just really quickly, even though I have kind of defined it. I just want to, I did promise people a little diagram which might help even more. but. So what's going on here is uh, we can the, stat the, names, the anonymous namespace simply makes it impossible for us to access these members from any other CPP file. The static keyword in this context does the same thing. I want to point that out. The static keyword does the same thing as defining an anonymous namespace. So if you see code like this, this is the C version of the C++ equivalent, which is properly using an anonymous namespace. Why not use private? Uh, private is uh, different. Private's used for classes. Anonymous namespaces are for accessibility in the context of namespaces, whereas private is for accessibility in the context of classes. Uh, so static keyword is different from C sharp static. In this context, it is, but it's not necessarily. Um, there are there are staticness that's similar to C sharp staticness, but not in this context. All right, is everybody thoroughly confused? I think my brain just fell out of my ear. Other than that, you know. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk about the linker really quickly. Oh, you got to be kidding me. My VM just ate my tablet. <laughs> Give it back. It wasn't Give it back. Um, oh, wait a sec. No, it didn't. Well, what? Then what did it eat? It ate something. Eh, whatever. Let's see if it works. Um. Oh, there we go. Okay. So. Uh. What we have, when compilation happens, when compilation happens, we have CPP files. So right now we have products dot CPP, and I really don't like the uh, softness of that brush. Where's my brush properties? And I don't <coughs> block caps. That and that. There we go. Okay, so we have products.cpp. This is like a sick joke. I want. <laughs> See, I can't do it with the larger, the larger brush. I really just can't. Um, Okay, that should be good. And then we have main.cpp. I'm just going to talk about main and products.cpp. These two things are absolutely unrelated, or for the most part, completely unrelated. They don't, they're, they're compiled at the same time as each other. 
Now main.cpp might have a method or a function called int main, which is our entry point. Oh, come on. There we go. So it might have a thing and it might say something like display products. Now, the fact that display products is right here is valid only if the compiler is made aware of the existence of display products. So when compilation happens, it starts with turning each one of these CPP files into the corresponding OBJ files. Sweet. Sweet. Then we can bring them into Max and yeah. work with them in there. No, they're not actually not um, the same. But um, um, I did guess that actually. <laughs> basically, what Display Products turns into is a uh, think of it like a uh, a placeholder. This gets turned into a placeholder. Now, display products must, you must make the compiler aware of the existence of display products by using a prototype. So we say void display products paren paren semi. We use this proto, or this prototype allows us to use this placeholder. There is so far absolutely 100% no correlation to products.cpp. Now products.cpp, if I can get my docking right, because it decided to freak out, products.cpp will have a void display products function in it. We hope. We hope. It doesn't have to, but let's just say it does. So far, when main.cpp gets compiled, it has no knowledge of products.cpp. At all. When products.cpp gets compiled, it has no knowledge that display products is being used by main.cpp. These two OBJ files are completely independent of each other. And what they contain is compiled code. They contain compiled code with all the instructions that the CPU needs to do to execute this code. The only thing that it doesn't contain is going to be the references or the specific memory locations to the functions that get invoked by the code. So they aren't technically usable programs yet. Remember, this is compiler time. Come on. Shift. Whatever. Okay, so this is compile time. After they get turned into OBJ file, ah, uh, ah, uh, there we go. After they get turned into OBJ files, they get sent to the linker. The linker takes both of these OBJ files and reconciles the placeholders. It reconciles the fact that display products is being used here without defi being defined and it recognizes that display products does exist here. So this OBJ file contains implementation. This OBJ file contains placeholders. Yeah, people are opening OBJ files in, in uh, Notepad now. <laughs> Good luck with that. Now, when these two OBJ files are combined by the linker, oh, 
come on. User error. How dare it do what you told it to? Yeah, no. So what happens with the linker is the linker takes both of these OBJ files. It reconciles the placeholders. So it first reconciles placeholders. And then spits out, guess what? It spits out. It spits out an executable. That's just rude. These two CPP files have no correlation with each other. They get turned into OBJ files. The linker reconciles the placeholders by finding the appropriate implementations given the specific criteria that was asked for based off the prototype. And then the linker reconciles these and spits out an executable. Can CPP files be included in other CPP files? There's nothing stopping you from doing that, but if you do that, I will cry. <laughs> okay, are there any questions about... Um, is the content of the OBJ files in binary? Yes. OBJ files are typically, typically binaries, but they're, what an OBJ file is is dependent on the compiler. It's just the object file, and it's going to contain, gen I mean, there's nothing mandating it being binary, but it always is. So that's why when we jump into our project in Windows Explorer, You'll notice that under the debug folder, we have uh, products.obj, math.obj. We still have our math2.obj, even though we deleted that header file. Uh, then we have main.obj. So each one of the CPP files turned into an OBJ file. And then the linker got a hold of all these OBJ files and spat out an executable. So are there any more questions? Over and above what possessed you to sort by name, by modified date rather than type by default? <laughs> you what? I don't know. I can't bear seeing a Windows Explorer window that isn't sorted by type. Well, oh, that's weird. I always, I typically do date modified or name. So I just really just want to point out, I want to stress the fact that these CPP files are independent of each other. If that's like the one thing that people got from this, then then I'm happy. I just came within a hair's breadth of pouring half a cup of coffee into the top of my computer. <laughs> Second of all, this is not advised. No, this is true. Part of the problem with having a 12 inch fan hole in the top of it. But anyway, there don't appear to be any more questions. I think your whiteboarding has, um, either your whiteboarding's done the trick or people have just died. I think people have just died. How many people have just died? No, no one. Excellent. <laughs> Steady now. <laughs> This will make more sense once you do the homework, I think. I think the homework's really going to help out. I 
I, I, if, if you could just do one simple example of the order that you would tend to do things as you come across them when you're putting together. Because, like, no, if you're programming, you you probably go, all right, I want to, I want in my main, I want to use a display products method. What order do you approach adding the relevant bits into different places? If you see what I mean. I would start with the header. I think if after the explanation, people are going, oh my god. But if you actually just just show it slowly once. Doing each of those bits from 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 a uh, well, you could <clears throat> you could have carried on in that project, but just added another uh, add a add a get string method over in a string CPP file or something. Not string, but you know what I mean. Well, I would do something like this. Um, I don't know if I wanted to uh, display a list of products. I would start with creating a header file called products. I would put in the include guards. Slow down. Slow down. Place my method. Then I would create the appropriate implementation. Sharper. How long have you been recording for exactly? Three hours, 50 minutes. Three hours, Three hours five, hours. five or one five. Three hours and 16 minutes. One six. One six. Just, so Just so people can find it. Flash pen, pen, pen. You stop talking. Well, yeah, I'm typing. Um, so, for example, my display products method would just say for int i equals zero, i smaller than product count, i plus plus, c out product, and then i plus one um, is product names at i and costs product prices at i. New line. And then I would have some sort of um, this isn't about the implementation of the methods and what they do. This is about what order to add includes namespaces usings. Well, this would be the order. Just what I just what I just what I showed. I would start with the header, then I'd create the implementation. I would start writing the method, and then as I needed more data, I'd add more fields to my to an anonymous namespace. And then instead of you started by uh, oh no you didn't. And then in main, I would bring on my products.h and say display products, which currently will just display nothing. Well, so that's how I would go about adding in the functionality. But yeah, I think it's uh, about homework time. Um, uh, I don't think that's happening. No, that's not happening. Okay, products.h is just this, display products. Um, why the anonymous namespace? Uh, the anonymous namespace would just be so that nobody else can sneakily access this data. Just encapsulating the data inside of anonymous namespace. Otherwise, it would be possible to maybe accidentally conflict names. Um, maybe another CPP file declared a product names or product prices array and then I'll get linker errors, and then maybe somebody else declared an extern product names and they started modifying my private data. The only people who can access this data are other 
pieces of code inside of this one CPP file. An anonymous namespace makes everything inside that namespace only accessible within the same CPP file. Pretty much just like private in C sharp does. Yes. Yes. Yeah, no. it, you can think of it like that, I guess. Yeah. Conceptually. I mean, I'd probably do something a little bit more robust here. Uh, this is just an example of something for people who are um, going to be working on the homework. I might do something like this. the C sharp programmers to look smug. Particularly those of us who are sharp. And then I would have another bit of code that actually represented the UI of, uh, of the program and they would just interact with the model like this. So this file owns the implementation for dealing with products. So then inside of my products.h I now have to provide my uh, prototypes for all the methods that I want people to access which means I also have to include in string and say std string and then I would say set product name std string and then set product price. And then inside of main, what I would do is I would say something like, well, uh, set product name zero, hey there. Set product price zero, that. And then I would say, see out, get product string at zero. Now effectively what I've done is actually it properly encapsulated some behavior and logic into another bit of code that's responsible for it and cleaned up things significantly. Right, adding products is going to be responsible for the product CPP. Okay, so let's talk about homework. In the last homework... Cool. In the last homework... In the last homework. In the last homework. In the last homework. Ugh. Who wrote this site? In the last homework. We had people um, create a vending machine that allowed people to insert product name and product prices in addition um, had them sort that data. Now I want people to really think about encapsulating or to refactor the program using functions, namespaces, and header files. Or header files and multiple CPP files. So I really want to see people start to break apart their logic using what we learned today with functions, namespaces, and header files to make things cleaner and more straightforward. Now, um, for anyone who's wondering about the bubble, presumably we'll be going over that in um, the open office. Are you planning to do that? Yes. I guess. Because you, you haven't actually covered it in this class yet. Right. So line limit, I'm going to say 40 lines, and that's that's uh, actually really um, really uh, generous. generous. But just so that people aren't freaking out, because C++ tends to be more verbose. Uh, 40 lines. Uh, this will include white space and comments. Unlike last time when we said... That's per, <coughs> per function. Yeah. Line limit, 
<laughs> yeah, line limit for the entire program. Uh, line limit per function is 40 lines. Including main. Including main. <laughs> okay, so any questions? No, you don't have to do the homework. Uh, no, a line include is anything with a semicolon, basically anything with a semicolon or a control control statement like a if statement or while statement or so on. So you can't just uh, stick everything on a single line with semis. And honestly, Wedgebob, by ne I mean this is this will be the third homework that is a version of the same program. This is a question. This week's homework is is about. There's very little modification. In fact, there's no functional modification to do. It's a question of making your code cleaner. And and getting used to moving functions things around really. And getting used to functions. And doing all the little bits of of graft that um, that you don't have to do with C sharp. But. But people really need to really know to, yeah. get, to get comfortable with using functions and declaring functions, and this is the this is a really I think a nice introduction to that. This this homework isn't isn't targeted to people like Segfault, <laughs> you know. This homework is tied uh, targeted to people who haven't used functions before, and at the very least, it'll open up if you guys attempt to do the homework, it'll open up a, a line of uh, dialogue um, that could be used to further explain things that you don't understand yet. Okay, so is everybody good? I'm about to hit the uh, stop recording button. Raw. Any more questions? Because the stop button is being hovered over. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, that will be the end of uh, 4A then. Yep. I believe. So, cool. yeah, see you guys all later. <laughs>